the March 22nd, two days after the spring equinox city council work session. Uh, we welcome springtime. It's always a pleasure to have longer days. We welcome the members of the public who are in person and who may be watching our usual video feeds online. Hybrid council meetings allow people to join online through WebEx or in person at the city and county building. We're continuing to watch COVID rates to make the safest choice for all of us. Masks are no longer required in city facilities, but attendees who prefer to continue wearing a, using a mask are welcome to do so. We will continue to monitor the situation and take re any reasonable precautions for the public and staff. As many of you know, there is no public comment during the work session. However, please join us at the 7 p.m. formal meeting tonight to share any comments. Your feedback is always welcome, and you can share with the City Council anytime by mailing us at P.O. Box 145 or 76 Salt Lake City, Utah 84114, emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or calling us on our 24 hour phone comment line at 801 535 7654. Taylor will be monitoring today's meeting. And as always, first on our agenda is the update from the administration. And I will I welcome the mayor and her chief of staff, Rachel Otto. Rachel will be giving us the update at this time. Great to see you, Rachel. And mayor. Hello, great to see you as well. Thanks for having us. Um, we have our typical update for you today, but uh, before we launch into our regular updates, I wanted to just take one minute and introduce a new member of the mayor's office staff, Jennifer Newell, who's in the front row here. Um, she was uh, just recently hired as the mayor's advisor, senior advisor on education. The council will remember that this was a, a position that was um, specifically recommended by the Commission on Racial Equity and Policing. And um, we're really excited to welcome Jennifer after a robust uh, public <laughs> process um, and stakeholder engagement around this position. And um, Jennifer was most recently at the Salt Lake City School District for about 24 years, working on all kinds of excellent equity and inclusion initiatives and is really excited to be here and, and work with all of you. Um, Jennifer, you wanna, does anybody, any questions for Jennifer or? Would you like her to take a minute? Jennifer, come up and introduce yourself. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Yes. As, as um, Rachel just mentioned, I'm Jennifer Newell. Um, just got hired as the senior advisor for education. Um, and I, as I, right before I got this job or in my interview process, I mentioned that I feel like I've spent like my whole life. This is like a culmination of everything I've been doing in my whole career. So I'm really so excited to be here and it just already feels like such a great fit and I'm learning so much and I also can feel already um, the importance of the school the school district background that I'm bringing with me and how uh, and that's a perspective that is much needed and it's really hard to get unless you've actually lived it. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you better. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome on the board the team. Thank you very great much. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. So Jennifer's first order of business is really getting our arms around the the memorandum of understanding between the police department and the school district on our school resource officer program. So she's doing a ton of work around that and we'll be excited to update you um, as we move forward with that work. So um, on to our regular updates. Um, we have some slides as usual. And it's pretty exciting because Salt Lake County is now in the low transmission category on the first slide. There, I think, is it Taylor? Yeah. So we're in low transmission now, which is great. Hospitalizations statewide have continued to decline over the past month. Um, also good news. Since we were last here on March 8th, we've seen a pretty decent increase in kids aged 5 to 11 in the county getting vaccinated. So that's great news. A tiny uptick in the kids aged 12 to 17 fully vaccinated. And then one um, slightly less exciting statistic for you is the percentage of Utahns who are current on their vaccinations has been holding at about 27 percent 
since the end of February. And so current on the vaccinations, you'll remember, means basically that you've had all of the vaccinations that you're eligible for. So two doses plus a booster, if that's what you're eligible for. Um, so that could probably stand to go up, especially given um, the next slide that I want to show you. This new variant that you probably are seeing a little bit about in the news called BA2. I think that means we're through the alphabet like six times with variants. I'm not 100% sure, but um, as of March 1st, we weren't seeing a ton of those cases in Salt Lake County, but um, it is, you know, apparently highly contagious along the order of Omicron, but also about like that severe. So, um, again, being up to date on vaccinations appears to be highly protective and, and largely keeps people out of the hospital. So that's really still the main advice from the health experts is to make sure that you're up to date on your vaccinations. Okay, next slide. And I'm not sure if this is because of the new variant or not, but you do see that there's like a little bit of a plateau there in the county over the last 14 days in terms of our confirmed cases. So that's just that typical 14 day snapshot that we normally give you. And then moving on to the next slide, um, you'll see again, just the tiny little incremental increases um, system wide with our citywide vaccinations there and. Um, in, in kind of looking at the data countywide, there is a bit of a uptick in confirmed cases in the 101 zip code. I didn't, I didn't pull that um, screenshot for you, but there are, you know, there we're, we're seeing some increases may, may or may not be due to the, the BA2 variant, but um, we'll pay attention to the county health experts advice on that and, and bring you anything relevant next time around. So I think next we go to Weston Clark, who hopefully is joining us virtually today to give a quick update on some of our community engagement work, unless there are any questions on the COVID related items. It look like there any questions. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks. And there is Weston. And next slide, please. All right. Uh, hello, council. Thanks for your time. Sorry not, for not being there in, uh, person i have a cold and these days that just means you stay away right because you never know but i you know should be good uh, a few updates to our engagement projects in the city for you this week i'll try to be as brief as i possibly can um, we have a, a few new additions to the list um, as always most of our uh, largest engagement projects can be found at that website www.slcgov slc.gov slash feedback next slide uh, the affordable housing overlay engagement continues with a planned citywide mailer that will come out in April. Uh, the Glendale water park survey is now open and will close on April 16th. Uh, the shelter zoning engagement continues with some internal analysis of factors to consider for future HRC locations. Hopefully that will be done at the end of the month uh, this month with stakeholder engagement starting in April. The North Point small area plan draft is expected in June. Public comment will continue during that time and through the adoption process through council. The downtown plan implementation is in its public input phase. A draft ordinance is expected April 1st with an internal review and public release the second half of April, followed by the adoption process. Uh, 1100 East reconstruction engagement continues with some smaller ad hoc on site meetings with constituents in the affected area. Um, and also city teams should finalize block level outreach this week on 200 South reconstruction. Next slide. Um, 6,000 uh, postcards are headed into the West side neighborhoods. Uh, with uh, information about new bus service uh, bus stops on demand service and August uh, UTA change day to work uh, towards some bus stop improvements and bus service improvements in the 600 North and 10th North areas. Capitol Hill traffic calming engagement continues. Uh, transportation uh, team is working with constituents to develop public engagement materials and project messaging. Online surveys are open for feedback on avenues street restriping. Residents are being asked to provide feedback on five Street redesigns, Virginia, B, 3rd, 11th, and Terrace Hills. Uh, next slide. 
We have a bunch of public utility updates added this time. I will highlight a few of them. Um, City Creek Water Treatment Plan Upgrade Project includes active work uh, with Capitol Hill Neighborhood Council and Greater Avenues Community Council. A project website is in the works. The Watershed Management Plan uh, will have a website as well. Um, it includes engagement with some um, uh, uh, ski resorts, canyon property owners, recreational groups, and nearby cities uh, through November of this year with a final document anticipated for the end of the year. Uh, Rose Park Jordan River project. This is a stormwater treatment project that is actually um, quite complete, um, but there will be some signage and vegetation added into the area to improve the public experience and understanding of the project. Um, State Street Waterline project from 1st Ave to 2nd North um, will include some major upgrades to utility infrastructure and have some pretty significant impact on North State Street. The public utilities team um, is presenting to the Greater Avenues Community Council on April 6th and has done some initial outreach to the LDS Church um, and other bordering property owners in the area. Um, construction should start late spring and hopefully be done by early fall. Uh, in May, public utilities should have a public open house for the water reclamation facility project with some important updates on design and construction progress. And finally, public utilities is working towards proposed utility rate increases. Um, following a presentation to the mayor, they will mail proposed rate increase notices to the city and other customers in mid April, followed by a robust social media campaign, encouraging public feedback in advance of the city council budget hearings. That is it for this week. If there's any questions, happy to try to answer them. Thank you, Weston. I don't see any questions from the council at this time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think Andrew Johnston is ready for the regular homelessness update. Uh, yes, just looking for the first slide if we have it. The first slide is usually the census at the resource centers. Uh, we talk about uh, month to month. And I'll, I'll act it out if you'd like that. Um, so the number was up here and it dropped a little bit and then it went up a little bit here. Uh, it's been about two weeks since we talked last. The, um, the number this week, I think is 97% occupancy, just below 98. Um, yeah, I can make it up as we go, or I can look at the, there we go. Oh, now it's up. Just thank you. 97.8% uh, that red one on the bottom, right? That's the average of all 3 of those resource centers in the last week. Uh, previous week, it was up above 98% and then 2 weeks ago when we last met, it was 97, 96%. So pretty steady, obviously, in the winter time. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Jordan River continues to be the priority for cleaning and abatements in the last couple of weeks. Um, we've got a lot of uh, constituent requests, particularly on the north end uh, by Day Riverside Library. And um, we'll talk about that in a second. Victory Road in the foothills is always a popular location. We know year in, year out. Um, in the wintertime, it is difficult to get up there physically uh, for the health department and others. So um, what we're trying to do now is offer some uh, basic services at the base there with uh, toilets and trash and those kind of services and ongoing engagement with the outreach teams, um, knowing that as we get into the warmer months and things solidify up there, we'll have to go up and, and uh, assess and see what's going on for uh, cleanliness and abatement issues up there. The resource fair most recently was last week at Day Riverside Library, and you can see the uh, partners who were there. I do want to point out uh, it was bad weather that day, so it was a little lower turnout than typical. Uh, but South Salt Lake has a homelessness staff. I don't think it's very big, but there's people who are dedicated now and they are working with the city heart team about best practices coordinating between the two areas because we have a lot of overlap of folks going back and forth between the men's resource center uh, in South Salt Lake and downtown and our resources here. Uh, so that's a really positive uh, step and some coordination happening. Next slide. Uh, going forward, we are going to have another resource fair uh, April 8th, and uh, we'll talk more about that as we go, uh, know where it's going to be. But you'll see that during the summertime, March to October, uh, there is a high utilizer court and homeless court at the Wigan Center, which happens every first Friday of the month. And that's stable so that everyone knows when it's happening and where. And most of the resource centers have electronic methods to uh, tie into that meeting so that folks who are there can actually uh, handle their cases remotely. Um, if they choose to. Now, the second um, Friday of each month is resource fairs. The next one will be April 8th, and those will be at rotating locations. 
And then the kayak court starts up again April 15th, and that'll be the third Friday of each month, again, rotating locations on the river. So you know there'll be a steady uh, schedule uh, throughout the summertime. So if folks are asking, we can get that out to people, and it's easier to find out where to get the resources and where we'll be engaging them. I believe that's the last slide. No, win more. Um, these are the current overflow options we have in place uh, for the coalition. The St. Vincent de Paul obviously is night to night. Uh, it will be closing the night of the April 14th into the 15th, um, as it does most years. You'll see that the scattered motels are slightly different. They do have some state and city funding that will extend to June 30th this year. Most of those hotel rooms are occupied by women as an overflow from the Geraldine. And then you'll see the high needs temporary program on uh, North Temple, the Ramada. Um, those are the folks who have higher uh, vulnerability based on medical needs or age. Um, they are being moved back into or given the option of moving back into the resource centers right now. That started last week. And so on a daily basis, the resource centers have a, a number of beds that open up just naturally. People don't come back. And so those are being reserved for folks in the Ramada to move back in there. So they have a bed available and it takes several weeks on that process. Um, most folks are taking the opp opportunity, some are not, and they can stay until April 14th. You'll see the Redwood overflow beds. Those are the night to night beds in those congregate areas at the Ramada. Um, those will be open until April 14th at night to the 15th, and then they won't be. Those folks are also being engaged and uh, being offered services as well um, to try and get them into their appropriate placements if we can do that. And then you'll still see the number again. We want to put that out to the public 801-990-9999. That is the number to call for access into the system. And Utah Community Action operates that line 24 hours a day. Are there any other questions right now? I don't see any questions, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know that um, Chief Brown has a brief update for the council today too. And then I wanted to either go directly to just quickly talking about Ukraine, efforts to support Ukraine, either before or after Chief Brown. I'm not sure. After Chief Brown. Okay, great. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, Council. Um, if you could bring up the slide deck, please. Council, this afternoon, I wanted to give you a, a brief update on some of our community outreach and some of the work that we've been doing here in the communities of Salt Lake City. Next slide. In the fall of 2021, we released our revised crime control plan, and that plan had four main goals. They were to one, lower crime, number two, to improve response times, number three, to fill our vacant positions, and number four, to continue building community relationships. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. Next slide. <clears throat> Last Friday evening, we were invited to the Calvary Baptist Church to participate in a law enforcement meet and greet. We had uh, the Pioneer Bike Squad attended, Deputy Chief Ewell, Captain Bennett, Captain Charlie Goodman, and myself went uh, to this event. And really, it was a very nice event where we had the opportunity to sit down with members from the Calvary Baptist Church in the community to have open and frank conversations about policing. I was truly impressed with our officers and, and some of the responses and the conversations that we engaged in. Listen, to be a good police officer, you need to be, you need to get out into the community and you need to be vulnerable and spend time with the communities that we serve. I want to share one example of one of the conversations I overheard our officer talking. Um, he was asked about diversity training that we receive in our training academy. And he said, that's really important. But he said, the real learning takes place in a, that. He said that that those learning uh, sessions take place in a classroom setting. The real learning <clears throat> happens every day when our officers are out in the field engaging in the in events like this and with the community that we serve. That is where trust is built and gained. So it was it was really that was a great event and we we certainly enjoyed that and looking to have looking forward to have more more conversations with Reverend Moses and Calvary Baptist Church. Next slide. It was great just a few weeks ago to be back at the annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. These large scale events bring so much value and opportunity to getting 
getting to know our communities that we serve. Um, we, we meet so many fun and different people. We look forward to many more parades this summer as well. Next slide. We were invited, uh, one of the schools, the Lutheran Redeemer School uh, reached out to us and asked if we, would, if we would send two patrol officers. And because our officers truly, they wanna be out in the community and in, that they serve. We had no problem recruiting two officers from patrol to participate. We went and visited with the, the children. We talked about the job that we do. And the most important thing is that everybody walked away with a sticker. Next slide. And again, Whittier Elementary School, just a few weeks ago, asked us to come and read to the fourth grade class. The officers were well received and uh, it was nice to be engaged with the kids uh, once again in the communities we serve in a school setting because of COVID. We haven't, we haven't been able to, to engage with them in the schools. And again, um, we had great conversations and they asked us to come back. So we look forward to that as well. Council, this is just, a, that's the last of the slides, but this is just a small sample of some of the events that we've done in the past three weeks. We are excited for spring and summer and the many more events that uh, we will be asked to participate in. Um, right now, we're in the process of getting our community outreach groups back together uh, in person because there's so much value in sitting down with the communities we serve. All of these events and these efforts will help build trust in the communities we serve. And so, Council, that's my update for today. Any questions? Thank you, Chief. And I don't see any questions this this time. Thank you. Ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> not to make things overly complicated, I had a couple more slides on the first presentation, but they are not crucial if it's uh, if it's a pain to bring them back up. Um, I know that both the mayor's office and the council office have been anxious to try to coordinate any support that we can for Ukraine. We have a sister city relationship um, with Chernivtsi. Uh, I probably said that wrong. Um, in Ukraine since the early 80s. And um, I think both the mayor's office and the council office has been in contact with our sister city there. They have, uh, we've just through some other partnerships, we've tried to figure out, you know, what they need, how we can get them supplies, it's been suggested to us through various channels that the most productive thing that we could do would be to encourage people who do want to help to donate money to organizations who are trying to buy supplies that are close to Ukraine. It's been difficult to get airlifted supplies to the country. Um, that, that's not my Ukraine slide, just so you know. Um, <laughs> And just in the in the interest of doing that, I I don't want us to you know necessarily support donating to one organization over another. But there were a couple of you know aside from the big national or or international um, groups that most of us probably know about the IRC or UNICEF or others who I'm sure are doing great work. There were a couple of local organizations that I I wanted to highlight with. You know, again, urging people to do their own due diligence on where they feel comfortable donating. But there's an organization called Strangers in Ukraine. You can find them at strangersinukraine.org. And um, they say that all of their proceeds go to raise them and Lifting Hands International via Equality Utah, which is a nonprofit organization based here in Utah, of course. Um, so Equality Utah has been donating some kind of infrastructure, Venmo, et cetera, to trying to get, you know, help them do fundraising and get that directly to getting supplies on the ground. And then um, uh, the Larry H. Miller group has been organizing a, a pretty massive fundraising effort too. So if anyone is interested in checking that out, you can see how to do that at lhm.com. So that's the Utah for Ukraine initiative. And that's all I have. And um, I believe that the council has something more on this. So yes. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. And I appreciate that. And uh, if we could make sure that we get all those uh, websites uh, out there on the social media, it'd be very uh, helpful. And thank you for your efforts with communicating with the uh, our sister city. I'm going to now uh, turn the time over to Councilmember Pui, and we're skipping to item 10 on our agenda. Uh, and I'm going to turn the time over to uh, Councilmember Pui, who's done uh, has contacted our sister city. Yeah, I uh, over the weekend I was uh, wondering wondering about a relationship between uh, any Ukrainian uh, municipality, and I, to my surprise, I learned about Chernitsky, and I probably 
also mispronounced that. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I learned that Mayor De Paulis uh, established and signed the sister city charter in 1989. And seven delegations from Chernitsky visited Salt Lake City and 17 delegations from Salt Lake City visited there. Uh, and that is not the end of the relationship between our cities. Uh, Karen Shepard, uh, knowing that our relationship with the city uh, helped them establish some financial support from Europe. Uh, we know that Karen Shepard's work in, uh, you know, in Congress and um, they're also the LDS church because of the sister uh, ship uh, between our cities sell a sent a lot of humanitarian help after the Chernobyl catastrophe that was affecting the kids in this city uh, in Chernitsby. So our ties between these two cities are uh, are very deep, run very deep. After 33 years, uh, I, I believe uh, they're still they're still there. Um, I uh, and over the weekend, I decided to message the mayor and the council in this city and for, to my surprise, they responded um, and they sent uh, uh, you know, they were very shocked that we were interested to know that how they were doing um, and and they were uh, happy to send us a video um, uh, about what they're doing. And the mayor of Chernitsky sent us a video, Roman Klitschak. Um, and, you know, I cannot even imagine um, being able to run a city, uh, you know, being a mayor or being a council or all of us here um, and uh, having to um, you know, if be thinking about bombs or, you know, while we're dealing with tens of thousands of other people in our country, uh, being moved to, to our city. Um, so this is, uh, they're fighting for their life and, you know, while this is, you know, my place to be having an, uh, you know, political war politics opinions. Um, uh, I just wanted to reach out to them as a human and as, uh, as, uh, you know, a leader in, in a municipality that we have very close relationships and that we have that video that they send us and with the mayor's administration and all those links to help. Um, it is my hope that many people in, in our city can, can support, uh, the people of the city that we have so close relationships with. Um, so yeah, that is, that is the, the what happened and I hope that we can play the video. Thank you very much, council member and we'll go with the video. Вітаю вас. Мене звати Роман Кличук, я мер міста Чернівці. Не буду зараз розповідати про багато історії нашого прекрасного міста і його туристичну привабливість. Зараз це не на часі. В наш дім пройшла війна. Ми залишилися ще не одним з небагатьох міст України, які не постраждали від російських окупантів. Великі міста в країні зараз є розгромленими. Окупанти не гребують нічим. Вони цілять школи, в садочки та навіть у лікарні. Ця війна йде без права. Діти плачуть на руках у матерів, і вони народжуються у сховищах під землею. З них виростуть зовсім інші люди, вільні. Кожен Україні став захисником у своїй землі. Ті люди, що вже давно живуть за, за кордоном, повертаються боронити Україну. Люди озброєні не, не лише прапорами і гімном зупиняють колони російських окупантів. Та що казати, в кожній домівці знають, яким чином знищити е, ворожу техніку. Наші IT-спеціалісти атакують російські сайти. Кожен школяр на, намагається про, пробити інформаційну завісу і показати правду, що відбувається зараз у нас. Ми об'єдналися і кожен допомагає у спільній боротьбі за свободу не тільки України, а всієї Європи. І в цій війні ми не самі. Тому ми щиро вдячні кожному з вас за вашу підтримку та допомогу. Її надсилають з багатьох країн світу. Зараз це дуже є важливим для нас, адже Чернівці перетворилися на величезний волонтерський хаб. Ми приймаємо тисячі біженців зі зруйнованих міст та допомагаємо їм. І всю допомогу, яку нам надсилають, ми пересилаємо туди, де вона зараз найбільш необхідна. Ваша підтримка додає нам впевненості в сьогоднішньому дні. А офіційна співпраця дасть надію на гарне майбутнє та швидку відбудову нашої країни.
розвивати, продовжувати розвивати культуру, освіту та місцевий бізнес. І тому для нас є надважливішою співпраця з такими містами, які ви є. Ми хочемо знову бути затишним європейським містом з багатою історією. Слава Україні! Героям слава! Дякую! Thank you very much, Councilmember Pui. I appreciate that. Councilmember Councilmember Balamoros. I wanted to say thank you to Councilmember Pui, Pui and the and the administration for getting this together and the information about donating. Um, I really don't have any words without getting emotional about this whole thing. And um, I think it's just terrible. We won't get into that. I just wanted to um, do a shout out to my friend Eli McCann, that is the one behind Strangers in Ukraine. He is a friend of mine for many, many, many years. He's a constituent here of either District 5 or District 6. can remember his address. And um, he's been instrumental. The, the first fundraiser that he threw a couple of weeks ago, he raised $150,000 right off the bat. So he's trustworthy. He has a lot of friends out there in the Ukraine. Um, and we know that that money is well spent. So thank you, Eli Mike. Eli McCann, if you're watching, uh, for doing everything you do to help your friends over there and our friends. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mayor, for that move, moving video. It's kind of interesting. It chokes you up. Uh, I was in the Ukraine 20 years ago working with the NATO and U.S. forces there on a Partnership for Peace program. And I know they're proud, they're resilient, they're strong, uh, and with a big heart. So we stand with you during these troubled times. Stay strong, keep the faith. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, something that stood out to me from the video is um, the mayor talking about how their cities become a hub for volunteers um, that have been displaced. And that really stuck out to me because so many times Salt Lake City has been in a similar situation, um, either being a, a refugee relocation city or being a relocation city for natural disasters that happen within our country. And um, so uh, it, I appreciated hearing that because I think it's an important connection between um, the people of our two cities and I really um, wish the best for our sister city and um, I really encourage Salt Lake City residents to make a donation um, and do whatever else they can to help support not only our um, sister city of Chernivtsi but also um, Ukraine as a whole. Thank you very much council members and thank you council member Pui, and thank you uh, mayor and Rachel on that uh, presentation. I will now move on to item number two, equity update. And I have Coletta here with us. Great to see you. And I think, okay, hold on. I probably have, I have, I don't see Moana here. Oh, and Fatima and Roxanne. What? Roxanne. Yeah, yes. yeah, and yeah exactly. I got it right here. It's great to see your actual faces again. I'm not seeing them enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's great to be with you all today. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to give a really quick REP update, and then Roxana is going to give you a language access update, and Fatima is here to talk to us about Know Your Neighbor efforts and also Welcoming America. So over the last two months, the Racial Equity and Policing Commission, they have listened to presentations from the Utah State Court Office of Fairness and Accountability. They were also introduced to our new senior advisor for education, Jennifer Newell. She's here today. And they were updated on recent legislative session bills um, affecting policing in Utah. Next month, they plan to follow up on some items that they had questions about from phase one um, with 911 dispatch. So uh, our director, Stephen Myers, will be attending that meeting next month. And in addition to that, the commission, they are beginning to focus specifically on racial and ethnic groups, as well as assisting chief in fulfilling ongoing recommendations from phase one. 
more specifically, they've started to focus on the training recommendation um, from phase one. And so the training subcommittee is supporting Chief in his efforts and his team's efforts to search for local BIPOC facilitators and curriculum creators to talk about the history of policing and to put together a full curriculum to introduce to new classes as they enter the Salt Lake City Police Department. Also, the school safety subcommittee is currently supporting Jennifer Newell's efforts to help renegotiate the process for the SRO MOU. And so I'm pretty sure that you'll hear, hear updates about that in the coming days, coming months. <laughs> All right, I'm going to yield the rest of my time to Fatima and Roxana. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Coletta. Um, greetings, council members. It's great to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm here to give you an update on what we're doing to make Salt Lake City more welcoming and inclusive to our refugees and new Americans. Um, we have the Know Your Neighbor Volunteer Program. It's a program in partnership with the State Refugee Services Office. Um, and in this program, we connect local volunteers to help refugees who've been resettled in the state of Utah um, and assist in variety of needs that create welcoming and inclusive environment. Um, the program uh, fulfills the gaps and needs that many refugees who are resettled in Utah need. It allows for individuals as well as groups to get to know and have an opportunity to actually understand and see refugees as a human, on a human level. Um, it's very instrumental and it operates and it's very successful as far as providing trainings and education programs to well-equipped refugees and uh, new Americans to feel integrated into our communities. Um, in addition to that, the program facilitates meaningful connections and friendships that help refugees as well as our communities thrive um, in this great valley of Salt Lake City. Um, we have many categories in this program. Um, some of them are list is the English skills learning, mentorship, tutoring, program class assistance, as well as uh, community-based organization support that many refugee groups look to starting out a nonprofit organizations and the goat farm and the goat farm as well. I was like, I can't hear my voice. <laughs> um, we have had over 515 volunteers who have served over 15,000 hours, um, 836 hours of service since the program has been launched. We currently have over 200 volunteers placed within our variety of volunteer opportunities, and it's great to see a lot of the community looking to support and create these meaningful friendship and relationships. Next, I want to tell you guys about Welcoming America. Welcoming America is a nonprofit organization leading a movement of inclusive communities and also making prosperous, ensuring that everybody in our communities, uh, as far as immigrants and refugees, they feel welcome and they're a part of our community. The Welcoming Network is comprised of over 300 nonprofits and local government. Um, we recently applied to become a member and we got granted a scholarship, which is very exciting. Um, we will have opportunities and have resources and technical assistance and also have an opportunity to transform our community and make it more welcoming for everyone. Um, we, they also have an initiative called Welcoming Week. Um, it, it usually takes place September 12th through the 18th, the second week of September. And many organizations have an opportunity to uh, double down on our more inclusive vision as well as find ways to bring together people across all lanes and differences to develop and understanding and a better mutual support for everyone. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague Roxana here. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer that as well. I got a question. Okay. <laughs> so um, family sizes and a lot of kids in, involved in the program? I mean, do you have a, how many kids is my question? Um, yeah, so I think uh, if I understand it correctly, we um, try to make preference and match families based off of their sizes. So if a refugee family is five, then we match with a volunteer who has kids of five. So the kids have an opportunity to also foster that integration and relationships. 
Okay. And do you guys do stuff with sp sports programs also? We do. Yes. We have coaches. Um, there's a volleyball tournament. There's a basketball soccer support. So there's a variety of uh, programs and initiatives that people can select based off of their preference. Oh, good. I want to get in. I want to talk to you a little bit more about that. Okay. okay wonderful. Thank you. Sorry to... sure. Thank you. Great. Uh, Zizan, can you hear me? <laughs> um, thank you. Fatima, uh, that's a great segue for my uh, report. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, inviting me to let you know a little bit about what we're doing in regards to language services. Um, what we want to do is build immediate capacity across uh, to provide language services across public facing departments in the city. And we want to do that for a couple of reasons. In some areas, it's the law, in, and more importantly, as the capital city, we want to be an example by being a more accessible and inclusive municipality and having language services will help us ensure that um, we, we provide access to those uh, training. I'm sorry to services and programs um, that to people for people with uh, limited English proficiency. Um, which in Salt Lake right now, I don't know why I keep wanting to move my head. I'll just move that. <laughs> uh, which in Salt Lake, that population is about 9.4% um, of uh, limited English uh, proficiency. And uh, uh, in terms of households, it's about 4.9. Um, and uh, so uh, to tell you a little bit about how, where we are at since you guys last uh, met me, I guess a couple months ago. Um, last year, uh, our team convened an internal language access force uh, task force, and uh, they were tasked to do a number of things like um, come up with recommendations for a language access plan, uh, research best practices for how to train, hire, compensate, retain uh, employees with uh, bilingual skills or multilingual skills. Uh, look at uh, best practices for how to um, prioritize document documentation for information uh, and materials for translation across the city. And um, what they uh, suggested, what they have recommended is that we move forward with a joint resolution uh, that establishes uh, a commitment for the city and but also as the most prudent way to get the process going and um so that that you will be seeing that uh forthcoming and uh if uh oh, i'm gonna refer to my notes make sure i don't miss anything um and then so once that recommendation is looked at and considered by you guys by by you folks um then we will move on into uh developing an, an administrative policy that will uh, set forth protocol, uh, guidelines, uh, operating principles for staff to follow when it comes to provide language services. And um, that will, will ensure that staff knows their roles and responsibilities when they encounter uh, people with limited proficiency. And um, and also, of course, with that, we're going to have a budget request uh, to cover those services because it's part of the process, so I, I'll take any questions. Question, council members, questions? Just as a quick comment, I, you know, this has been, you know, this is an important issue for me and for, I believe, pretty much everybody, uh, everybody here. I, I'm, I'm very thankful to the administration for making this a priority and, uh, and your work on this. Um, there's a lot of people in my area uh, that, you know, only speak Spanish uh, and other languages. Uh, and, you know, this is their government, um, and I want to make sure that they understand that, we, you know, we want to help and we want to connect them. So I appreciate the work. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know up in Ogden, they have a stipend in the city for workers who have facility in another language and they get paid a specific stipend and can be expected. I love that because I feel like that invests in skills that our workers bring and potentially those who are engaged in these spaces for the first time as representatives of their cultures and, and families. Are we considering any models like that? I, I love that dual 
dual outcome of that model. Are we considering anything like that? Yes, the task force definitely. Um, <laughs> I'm excited too. I just got to control myself. Um, <laughs> no, 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 Mama. We, no, we're allowed joy here. Be, jo be joyful. <laughs> um, yes, the task force uh, did come up with uh, recommendations and ways that we can um, look further just to have employees as volunteers um to provide their services because that means stepping away from the regular jobs so it would definitely uh be advantageous to provide some sort of incentive um so we need so, to pay our yeah. people for the skills they bring <laughs> and and to that um having said that there there is quite a few employees who speak other languages so i i mean it would be a perfect fit to have the people who already know how the the city process works to provide the services to people with limited English proficiency. So there's definitely resources in house. I love that. Great questions. Thank you very much. Fatima, Roxana, Coletta. Thanks. Nice job. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Have a great day. Yeah. With old eyes, you gotta move your paper. Okay, we're moving on to item number three, an ordinance homeless resource center and homeless shelter text amendments follow up. And at the table we have Nick and Nick, maybe Nick uh, Norris is on the screen. It's all yours, Nick. It's all me. Okay, um, as a reminder, two weeks ago, the council had the briefing on the text amendment to homeless shelters and homeless resource centers can you hear me i'm sorry i'm not sure it's close enough um based on that conversation can you hear me that's better um based on that conversation the council had directed staff to work with the administration to prepare two ordinances pertaining to the hrc's shelter uses um one would create an effective date for when HRCs, excuse me, the first one would eliminate HRCs and shelters from the land use tables currently. And the second one would bring them back with an effective date in the future at the time the date was to be determined. So when during that drafting process, um, we sent out the original ordinance last week and over the weekend staff noted that we may have unintentionally created a situation where there would be a gap between when the ordinance was updated and when the effective date would occur that would have that would create a situation where homeless shelters or a new homeless shelter or an hrc could be built without coming in under the new guidelines that planning staff is currently processing so we worked with the attorney's office yesterday and based on the changes that were made we sent out an updated ordinance this morning to the council members to review um, those changes will do two things. One, the first ordinance is to, again, to remove the HRCs and shelters from the current land use tables. And then the second one is going to implement the future certain date of when they would come back in of May 3rd, 2023. That is a Wednesday after the first Tuesday council meeting, just so that we, we know when that is. Um, in addition, we, um, we tied the two ordinances closer together, referencing them back and forth, and they are also titled Ordinance 15A and 15B. And they would be, if the council can, when the council adopts them, if you do adopt them, would be adopted at the same time pursuant to the way the motion sheet is written so that we know that there's no gap there. So that's what is being proposed by the staff and for the council to consider tonight at the public hearing. Are there any questions on that that we can help answer? Councilmember's questions. Councilmember Walter Morrison. I have I have a comment, and I think um, thank you for catching that. Thank you for the conversation that we all started a couple of weeks ago with this ordinance and how we plan on proceeding. Um, I'm invigorated because of the of the conversation that I've heard from my constituents. Not that I hadn't heard before, but there's obviously a, an interest, and I think it's an in, there's an interest from me and my constituents to look at the system as a whole and rethink and re review i guess of what has worked in the past for our city and what hasn't and how we can improve um 
the whole system to help our um, unsheltered neighbors. And um, also there's a conversation that uh, we, I think Council Member Fowler mentioned last week about um, this $55 million for affordable housing um, legislation uh, by the state that I think it's something that uh, we should add to our whole system, maybe in a more localized, localized way. And I'm also interested in creating, if it's not there yet, but I think we are going to create some sort of a commission where we can, as council members, um, to talk um, through all of these things with the administration and the service providers and all the constituents. So I'm once again invigorated by the conversation and I am very hopeful and very positive that we'll have a better outcome. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'm gonna amplify what Council Member Valdemoros just said. This is, nothing about this is easy or desirable. Nothing about the continuation of what we're experiencing now on a seasonal basis is easy or desirable. Um, and in my experience, personally and professionally, hitting a pause button and doing the hard work and digging deep is sometimes the only way to get out of negative cycles. Um, so as I look around my neighborhood, um, I'm actually terribly concerned about what this summer holds for us. We typically see escalations in activities when we try to share public lands once again, and there's a lot of compassion fatigue among my neighbors, and I'm not willing to call them Karens or anything derogatory. I am willing to say that those who are sheltered and those who are unsheltered have sustained incredible stress in our city. I'm going to say I continue to be disappointed by the lack of other counterparts to show up to alleviate the pressure when they should be. Um, and I will say that this is one of those scary, bold steps that I think our city has to take in order to get our house in order to protect our unsheltered constituents and those who live alongside them. And I, I'm prepared to stand in headwinds for it as long as we are following best practices, good advice, and the impulse to protect as many people who belong here in Salt Lake City as possible. Thank you very much, Councilman Wharton. Um, I just want to add that I think since I've been on the council um, is when our new shelters have come on. It's um, when the road home is closed. Um, and so much of the problem that Salt Lake City um, is trying to deal with right now in terms of providing services to unsheltered folks um, is uh, a problem that we're just having to react to year after year after year. And there, there are um, greater forces at work that are um, compounding that issue and I, and it seems like we're getting um, in some ways we get fewer tools um, with this change in the law that has happened and I think it does create an opportunity for us to um, try to do something that is a little bit more um, thought out in advance so that we aren't just reacting to things so that we're in a better position to help more of our unsheltered residents long term. Um, and I also really hope that this is an opportunity for other um, municipalities and other stakeholders to come to the table. Um, but I, I, I do want to be clear and I hope that people hear this today um, that are planning on calling into our meeting tonight that that I I don't want to say, I'm not willing to say, uh, I'm not willing to vote to say that Salt Lake City is not going to um, host shelters anymore, and that's not what we're doing. Um, we, we have to hit this pause button so that we can plan on how to do this better in the future, because this is not a problem that's going to go away. It's not, I don't think any of us on this council um, or our mayor think that you know, in the next uh, year, we're going to be able to um, solve um, this problem, but we do need this time to be able to be in a better position to respond and to meet the needs, not only of our, our sheltered residents, but our unsheltered residents. Um, so I hope that people hear that. I hope that people understand that 
um, Salt Lake City is going to continue to be the leader um, in the state in terms of compassion, um, in terms of um, humanitarian efforts, in terms of providing affordable housing, um, and in terms of we still are going to have more shelter beds than any other municipality. We're going to have more services than any other municipality. Um, and I think to Councilmember Petra Eschler's point, um, our residents have stood up year after year after year um, and continue to open our doors. Um, and I think the, the, equitable, the, the most equitable thing, the most logical thing, the best way for us to be in a better position to help uh, is for us to, to take this pause and get, um, uh, get some of these issues with our planning and zoning resolved. Um, and then also talk about that in context of not just shelters, but um, housing first, putting people into homes, um, people and, and narrowing that gap between people that are habitually camping and habitually in shelters um, and people that are able to be in um, stable homes. I do believe in homeless or in housing first. And um, I think that this is is part of that and our gentrification study that we're going to talk about is part of that our affordable housing overlay is part of that, but I am. Um, as difficult as this has been and as frustrating as it's been to be in this situation over the last 4 going on 5 years now. Uh, I welcome this opportunity to um, try to do something that's more intentional and more well thought out than what we've been able to do in the past. So I'm, I'm eager to get started and I'm eager to have those plans come back before this council. I hope it's sooner rather than later. That's why we're putting this deadline in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Wharton. Councilmember Pui. Sorry, <laughs> Councilmember Petro and Councilmember Valdemores. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'm hope I'm go ahead. One minor change that we will make that is actually kind of a big change. It's easy to make Wait, it um, the effective date. We're going to change to April 1st, 2022. Right now it's upon publication that may have taken longer. So we just caught that today. So that will be well, we caught it like 20 minutes ago. So the effective date of the ordinance to remove them from the land use tables will be April 1st, 2022. Because the moratorium expires on the 2nd, so. Easy to change, but significant items. So, wonderful comments, and I appreciate that. And I'm very hopeful uh, in the dialogue and the work we have uh, cut out for us. And uh, I think we have the right people here to talk. And I think the uh, community is welcoming to the conversation. And uh, I look forward to uh, future discussions on this. So, appreciate that very much from everybody's standpoint. Uh, nice work. Mr. Chair. And I will move on to. Councilman Romano. Yeah, can you hear me? No, we can't hear you. Okay, uh, we'll proceed and we'll uh, bring in Councilman Romano when he gets back online. We'll move on to item number. Thank you very much, Nick. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll move on to item number four, an ordinance on the Stealth Tower text amendment. And we have Brian Fomer with us and we have Aaron on the screen. Good afternoon. Good, afternoon. Good to be with you. This is a proposal to amend the Salt Lake City Zoning Ordinance 
to allow stealth wireless towers up to 75 feet in height as a conditional use in the public lands zoning district citywide. The request is associated with the applicant's proposal to build a stealth tower at the Pioneer Precinct, Pioneer Police Precinct, at 1040 West, 700 South, but the requested amendment would apply to all properties in the public land zoning designation throughout the city. And I believe the applicant is on the call and available. And now I'll turn it over to Aaron. Brian, good afternoon, council members. Aaron, you have to sp speak up just a little bit, Aaron. All right, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay now? Uh, am I still, still a little weak? Quiet? Okay, hold on. I have a solution. How about now? Is that better? I think we can hear you. Keep uh, speak as loud as you can. Okay, so I want to. There's a presentation I think that's supposed to be pulled up at some point. But while we're waiting for that, I wanted to make it clear that stealth towers are currently allowed in every zoning district, provided they meet um, the height, setback, lot, bulk requirements. Aaron. Hold on one second. You're, it's you're really weak at this point, and it's probably too important for us to. And I think we're working on our end. Now. Okay, Council or uh, Salt Lake City, we're going to take a five minute pause. Got to okay. Appreciate this. Thank you. Hello. Is this working now? Or is it still not great? Hey, hey Aaron, you're going to take yeah. a break to try to fix. Yeah, some Aaron, we're on a break right now. We're going to come right back to you. Okay. Thanks. We're we're trying to troubleshoot the DS sound quality in our room. Although it is very helpful if you continue speaking, Aaron, as it will help us to test our audio. Okay, then I will continue to speak. I don't really have anything uh, important to say. Well, I see a countdown chart behind you. It looks like you're counting down to something enjoyable. Oh, that's a Disneyland countdown. Um, Perfect. All right. We're just checking out different speakers. Thank you for staying on the line. All right, Aaron, if you could give us just a little bit of sound, that'd be great. Okay, here's a little bit of sound. Can you hear me all right? That is much better. Thank you Excellent. so much for your patience and your contribution to the fix. Of course. And so hold on, let me get the other council members in the room and we'll be right there. Don't move.
Aaron, are you up? I am here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, and I think, yes, we're ready to go. So you're gonna start from the very beginning, rewind for, to the beginning. All right, and I believe there's a presentation. I, it's available on the agenda website. Um, whoever's on tech at the moment, AB. But while we're waiting for that to get up, I wanted to uh, just reiterate that stealth towers are permitted sorry, in all Council zones. Chair. Sorry, Aaron. Council Chair, WebEx is not receiving our audio. Okay, now it's live. Thank you for the pause. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Continue now. Okay. The uh, stealth towers are permitted in every district, um, provided they meet the height and bulk and lot requirements within that district. So, for example, in the PL district, buildings up to 35 feet, 35 feet that are not government facilities can be up to 35 feet tall, and a stealth tower can be that tall in that district. So this request is specifically to allow those stealth towers beyond, standalone stealth towers beyond that height, um, up to 75 feet. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So just to lay out what exactly is a stealth tower, it's completely disguised as another object and concealed from view to hide that intended use and appearance. And in the standards, a, a stealth tower needs to conform with those dimensions of that disguise. It can't be a, an out of proportion water tower um, and it needs to be in constant with the surrounding. So it, ne it cannot be out of place. And that is determined by the planning director. And like I said there, stealth towers are currently permitted in all districts. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a map of the PL district and districts with building heights below 35 feet, um, well, 45 feet. I think RMF 45 is also included in here. Um, the red are the PL districts, and you can see that they're in, usually individual lots or smaller clusters, and they're integrated with other districts. And I'm sorry, then, Council it, Chair. It is, we are getting varying responses about WebEx audio, broadcast audio, and in the room audio. I apologize. We are, we, we know Aaron can hear us, so WebEx is confirmed. Our broadcast audio is not going through, so that's what we're trying to do. And we can see it here on our screen that
For everybody who can hear me, we're about to begin again, but I'm going to have a message from Cindy Lou, the city recorder. Thank you, Council Chair. So essentially, the WebEx meeting is live and can hear us and you in the room can hear us. So your open public meeting is satisfied with that requirement. However, you there is great effort and transparency to broadcast these meetings through Salt Lake City TV, Facebook, PrimeGov, through a variety of methods. That is the service that's down right now. SLC TV is ready to troubleshoot, but doesn't want to hold up your meeting. So we are comfortable with continuing to troubleshoot while you continue your meeting satisfying all legal requirements with the intention of having this resolved as quickly as possible, but without inter further interruption. And the recording will be. The recording is fine. And, and we will be able to publish that recording at a later time. Correct. Okay. It just won't be live. It just won't be live at this time for this work session. Correct. Thank you. Are you, is that the decision? And I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, proceeding for the work session. Okay. Um, and then we'll make a decision at that point. Okay. Okay. And we'll keep troubleshooting. Thank you. So thank you very much. So back to Aaron. There you are, Aaron. Great to see you again. <laughs> uh, and hopefully we'll be able to bring up your slides also. But you don't have to start from the beginning. You can start where you were, where you left oh, okay. off. I don't need to go back at all. No. Thank you. Excellent. So while we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, here we go. So like I was saying, on this map, the red lots are the PL district where this request is taking place. And the blue lots, the blue areas are uh, those districts residential districts, small scale commercial districts that would be largely impacted by a type of amendment like this. Let's go to the next slide. This is an illustration to hopefully give you an idea of the height differences in those districts. And that monopine is for illustrative purposes only. Again, stealth towers can take many forms. Next slide. So at the December 8th meeting, the planning commission forwarded a negative recommendation to the city council and planning staff also recommended denial. Um, we can go to the next slide. These are just a brief summary of some of the reasons why staff recommended denial. As proposed, the um, text amendment would create unpredictable outcomes for for new stealth facilities. Um, as discussed on that map, new stealth towers up to 75 feet would likely be out of scale with surrounding development. Uh, issues with conditional uses, creating that community expectation of denial when state statute really makes that very difficult. Um, because if a, if a negative impact can be mitigated, the planning commission is required to approve that, that conditional use. Some of the language in the proposal is confusing, and if the council were to forward, you know, approve this or consider approving it, um, they would probably need to get back with the legal division and with planning staff to create something a little more clear on that table. Um, and then the proposal is not comprehensive, does not cover all issues that might come up, and the proposal did not make an effort to really change change the code to to benefit the city and and the community and so with that that's in my presentation and i know that pete simmons and melissa reagan uh, from verizon are here to answer any questions you might have i'm also here and looks like wayne is there too next to brian thank you aaron for that presentation uh, thank you wayne for showing up <laughs> appreciate that Council members, any questions? Council member Pito. Is the crux of the concern expressed so far with the proposal and that lack of clarity? Is there a path that you can envision to where these stealth towers would be acceptable given a clarification or an improved proposal? 
well, I'm, I'm sitting here, so I'll go ahead and just answer. Um, you know, I, with telecommunication towers, we have, they're basically allowed in one form or other, another all throughout the city. Um, we recently were, were kind of handed, um, allowances for things in the public right away. Um, small cell wireless things of that nature, but we just, from the planning division standpoint, we'll, in our re, uh, reason, recommend recommending denial to the planning commission. A big part of that is, you know, this was 1 single, uh, proposal to, to put this in 1 location. Um, felt that in order to really look at stealth towers throughout the city in these zones, that there should be a more comprehensive look at our cell regulations. Um, to see if, you know, if, if our current regulations are meeting the need of the city, as well as meeting the needs of the, um, of the, uh, providers. And we just didn't think it appropriate to kind of handle this in a piecemeal approach, um, without a, a thorough analysis. Well, then that leads to the follow up. Do we have the capacity and bandwidth to do that more comprehensive evaluation that you speak of? So I'm going to. Oh, go ahead, Nick. So, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and, and the answer to that is, is no, we don't. Um, but I also want to point out that. That there are multiple avenues where cell towers can be erected throughout our city. And in almost every zoning district, and just because that they, they may not. Be the most efficient for the providers perspective. Um, cell towers, particularly those in our neighborhoods, continue to be one of the most controversial land use items we see. Um, and because they have so many options on how to provide the service, we didn't feel like at this point in time, without full understanding of being able to share network data and things like that, that the there was that it warranted a change in our policy without um, a, a brought that broader discussion that Wayne was talking about. And so um, that's, that's kind of where we are. Thank you, Nick. Council member mono. I think you had a. Question or comment. Thanks Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Okay. I know you have to speak up a little bit. Okay. Us. Okay. Um, well, I, first, I have a question. Why is it in the PL district that this is proposed? Is it common for cell towers to be located at schools rather than um, having it be proposed in like commercial districts in general? Yeah. That's, I was going to say that's correct. Uh, that's common, but this specific request um, came out of the applicant's desire to place a stealth tower at the Pioneer Police Precinct. So they're wanting, that's the reason they're requesting the PL here at this moment. And would that be something that if a app, if a carrier wants to place a cell tower at the police precinct, they just can do that? Or is that like a commercial lease agreement? What What's the process yeah. for a city facility to allow a cell tower to be put on it. Yeah, I'll go ahead, Aaron. Um, so basically, obviously the property owner has to agree to allow that to happen. And, um, so for example, in the, in the case of, um, uh, a school and it's a public school, the school district has to be okay with it happening around city property. The city has to be okay with that. And they'd have to go through whatever processes in place to establish that lease agreement. Okay, thanks. That helps me understand this specific request. I'll just say that I um I I think those fake tree cell towers are hideous and I really don't want to see a bunch of them going up in our city. So I would even I I would be more inclined to allow just a cell tower that looks like a cell tower than one that looks like a fake tree, regardless of height. So, um, to me, uh, this is a non-starter for me, but, um, I think that there could be other ways that could meet the providers needs that would not be 
fake trees. Now, some of those other things that you were showing pictures of, Aaron, may be a little bit less offensive to me, and maybe I could get around some of them that look like signs or other things, but um, the fake trees to me are, are non-starters, so I, I really would not like to, I know that you said they're already allowed, I would not like to allow them to be any taller or um, prol proliferated any more than they currently are. Thank you, Council Member Mono. Any other further comments from the, or questions from the Council? I just wanted to find out if Councilmember Mano will be more interested in a water tank uh, looking one than a fake tree, but just just that. I I I mean the picture was less uh, disturbing to me than the fake tree, but we don't really have a lot of water towers in Utah because we have hills, so it's not really something you see in our landscape very much. I know we do have a couple out on the west side, so uh, but it it feels like that would not be necessarily appropriate in in utah because because we don't have that type of water tower very often thank you and uh aaron uh you said the petitioner was online yes uh pete simmons and melissa reagan are both available for questions if, if you have any or if they want to say anything i don't see any questions from the council uh they are, we can give them uh, five minutes to speak if they so desire. <clears throat> Council member, for, uh, Council member, yes, I definitely Verizon would love to kind of give you some in, insight into the reasons why um, for our proposal here. You know, when we, when we initially came into this area, this is an area that Verizon's finding. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you're really hard to understand. You have to speak up a little bit today. Thank you. Let's see what I can do here. So the reason why that's before you, that what's before you this today uh, to look at allowing for um, stealth facilities within the PL zone is because Verizon currently has an issue with coverage in that area. And based on the code, um, you know, we looked at other areas. We looked at field lights on city properties at the ballparks. Unfortunately, the city wasn't interested in proceeding forward with us. Um, we've looked at, you know, there's really no vertical assets that can get us above the built and natural environment in that area. The reason why we went with a, you know, initially we looked at an 80 foot stealth um, facility, stealth model pine at the Pioneer Precinct. And the reason why is because in that immediate area, there are several, there is quite a few uh, pine trees in that area, uh, you know, just near the precinct, there's over 19 of them, um, ranging in size from 23 feet all the way up to 61 feet in height. And in order for us to get a signal out to our customers, we need to get up above the natural and built environment. Um, and so when we initially talked to staff, um, they didn't see an issue with us proceeding forward with this because again, as Aaron had stated, it, they are allowed throughout the zone, um, throughout the city, and at the time, we were unaware that there was kind of a height limit because, because unfortunately, the municipal code on um, stealth towers is somewhat silent, other than it allows for them to be placed in pretty much every zone district as long as it meets the height of that zone district or whatnot. But again, it doesn't give us any direction of like the type, sizes, what they're looking for. And so, in order for this area, we felt that a model pine would be the best fit because again, of all the existing pine tree vegetation in the immediate vicinity of where we were placing it. And so that's why we went with that. And I, and I understand, <clears throat> As Councilman uh, Matto had mentioned, that there are, you know, it depends on what the application is going to be as far as stealth in, in the areas. And that's why initially when we came through, we looked at doing a, a full, um, you know, looked at the entire city and just kind of try to do a blanket allowance as a permitted use based on initial discussions with staff and trying to make this work. Um, and as we, when we went through that process with that language, um, we, when we talked to staff, they had some concerns, they had some issues with that. And so then we narrowed it down to do a conditional use because as we also met with some of the various community um, groups, the, the, one of the biggest things that they had, you know, uh, concerns with is um, having the ability to have a say. 
And whereas if it's a permitted use, if I were to go in there with a 35 foot stealth tower, it's a permitted use, I can get a building permit, nothing can be done. There's no discretionary review, it's an approved project. Um, whereas even if I were to go with a small cell facility, as um, <clears throat> Nick had mentioned, you know, and as well as Aaron, you know, we can go up to 45 feet in the public right of way. The issue with going with small cells, I mean, granted, there are varying, you know, there you have small cells to our um, in our toolbox, we have macro facilities in our toolbox and whatnot. Those are the kind of the two types of facilities other than if we were to do like wall mounted or roof mounted, but unfortunately in this area, there's nothing, no vertical assets that we would be able to work with other than like there are um, light poles at the park, at Jordan Park in the area. But again, like I mentioned, um, the city was not interested in proceeding forward with any proposal on there. Um, when we approached the police, the police uh, precinct, they were very much interested in working with us because they and their officers are having an issue. In fact, um, uh, Captain Sterling had reached out to us. We had, um, I'd reached out to him to just confirm if there was, if there was a need. And as I, and I initially talked with the, the police department, um, their officers definitely chimed in. There was a definite need and an issue for them in that area to provide better wireless service. And so, you know, if we were to go with, as, as Nick had mentioned, yes, there's different tools in our toolbox, box, but not every tool provides the best service that we're looking for. Um, you know, I know staff had looked at, you know, trying to have us do a bunch of small cells in that area. The concern is you're not gonna get the same level of service as that because they are, I mean, granted, we can get up to 45 feet, but it doesn't provide, you know, we, it doesn't provide us the service in that area. And so we just felt that because of the fact that, um, you know, there was some issue or some concerns from some of the community groups about not having a say um, in the design, we felt that a conditional use permit process would be the best because that would provide the ability for the community to raise concerns and to provide some input into the ultimate design of that facility. And so that's why that's before you the way it is today. And the reason why we did again, the PL zone is because the PL zone is where this existing facility is. And we just felt that, you know, the PL zone, you know, um, when we get into residential areas, really the only areas that are available to us in residential uh, prior to small cells coming to fruition were church schools and parks. And so, um, you know, and so, yeah, and if you have any questions, we're here to. I do not yeah. see any questions from our end. Thank you very much for uh, the uh, comments. I appreciate that. And no other further comments. Thank you very much, Brian, Aaron. Nice job. And Wayne, appreciate that very much. Nick, we'll be moving on to item number five. The Northern Zoning Map Amendment to at the Western Gardens, 550 South, 600 East. Brian's at the table, and Amy also coming probably on the screen somewhere. But Brian, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> this is a proposal to amend the zoning map for property at 550 South, 600 East, from its current neighborhood commercial designation to form-based neighborhood district, or FBUN2, zoning. Western Garden Center is currently located on the property. The request would facilitate redevelopment of the property into a multifamily project. I believe the applicant is on the call and available to address the council. And I will now turn it over to Amy Thompson. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm covering this item for Lex. I just have a couple context slides. Um, can you hear me okay? Try again. Can you hear me okay? Uh, you're still really weak. Let's see. How's that? Any better? No. Let's see. Try again. How's that? It's getting better. One more test. Testing, testing. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll try to talk extra loud too. Sorry about that. Um, as Brian mentioned, this is a, a text amendment. 
for the property located at approximately 550 South 600 East. Um, if you could go to the first slide, please. Um, Planning Commission forwarded a positive recommendation on this proposal to the city council. Um, one thing to note is this property is also located in a local historic district. Um, this project was also presented to the Historic Landmark Commission in January of this year to get to get feedback on the proposal. Um, and any new construction on the proposal will require um, review and approval from the Historic Landmark Commission at a public hearing. Um, these next few slides are just some context slides. If you could go to the next one, please. This is an existing zoning map of the property. Again, the request is to rezone from the existing CN neighborhood commercial zone to the FBUN2, which is a form based urban neighborhood district. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is the existing site. Um, again, it's currently occupied by Western Gardens Commercial Center. And next slide, please. This is a view of Hawthorne Street, which is just west of the proposal. Um, this view is looking west down that street. And next slide, please. And east of the proposal is uh, Trolley Square on the east side of 600 East. And the zone change to the FBUN2 respects the central community master plan desire for a transitional zone from the high density RO zoning to the north to the low density single family neighborhood to the south, while allowing for multifamily housing uses, uses that meet the purpose statement for the zone. This location with the FBUN2 rezone will create a people oriented place with diverse housing opportunities, convenient shopping and mass transit opportunities. There are also opportunities for employment within walking distance and the final building design again will need to be appropriately scaled um, to respect the existing character of the neighborhood, um, which can largely be addressed as part of the new construction process with the historic landmark commission. Um, the applicant is on the line and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Council, any questions for Amy? I do have one question, Amy. Um... In the master plan, it's uh, in the master plan. In the staff report, it says that the HLC didn't provide a recommendation to us. What does that mean? Um, or what kind of discussion was had, and why wouldn't they say anything about it to us? Thanks. So, as part of the um, amendment process, the planning commission can recommend that the landmark commission provide. Um, feedback on the proposal. I don't believe that was part of the motion. It, it did initially go to planning commission um, and they made a decision on it, but the applicant did take it to the landmark commission for feedback. But as part of that process, the landmark commission is not um, required to provide a recommendation. Um, they're just a advisory body in this case. Thanks. Um... I am not sure. I think um, I heard loud and clear from my constituents, or at least from some of them. Um, they, they do have concerns with the FBUN2 zoning district, as Brian may be aware. Um, it's one of those things that are hard for me um, to decide on or to have like my heart set on one thing because, you know, we do need um, density in our district. We need a variety of options um, on housing, um, but it's also um, in an area that it's um, not as dense and it's um, it's hard for the for the neighbors to see the change happen. So I'm I'm not I'm not sure yet. Um, but another thing that I don't I didn't read in a staff report, maybe Brian, if you have an answer on that, um, these are opportunities for the RDA and for our housing programs to offer <laughs> some financing so that we can get some affordable housing if need if you know if the developer is inclined to do that that's something that would really help um, our mission um, for affordable affordability in district 4 and in the city so any of those talks have you been involved in that they might be inclined to offer affordable housing I've not been in uh, discussions with them about that, but we can look at some options that would be available and 
get back to you on that. That would be great. Thank you. Other council members? I just have more of a, on the uh, technical side, uh, could you refresh my, my mind on the height restrictions for the, for the uh, FEN2 and the parking uh, min maximums on the parking? Is it, uh, cause I don't remember seeing, I'm just seeing how much asphalt we're gonna have and how high these buildings could possibly be. So in terms of the maximum height allowed um, for the FBUN2 zone, um, it varies depending on development type. Um, the, the applicant intends to develop a multifamily building here, um, which could potentially be four stories and a maximum height of 50 feet. Um, in terms of the parking, um, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can. Hey, yeah. Amy, th this is Nick. There's no minimum parking requirement in the FBUN2 zone, and I think one key component of it in this area is that the trolley um, track station is a block and a half north of the property. And, is, and the density on the uh, mixed juice, is there a density maximum on the mixed juice? No. It's whatever you can basically fit within your allowed building scale based on heights and setbacks. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for uh, Amy or uh, Brian? All right. Appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. And can I actually just add one clarification to what I just said? Sure. Is that because this is in the in a local historic district, the Landmarks Commission actually has discretion. Um, in terms of the building scale. And so even though the zoning may allow um, 50 feet or small setbacks, the Landmarks Commission actually does have the authority to require additional types of things in order for the scale of the whatever's proposed to fit in with the historic context. So if you were, we were to approve the zoning change it still has to go back to them for any uh, scale or uh, approval on the uh, design. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. That's my mono. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment on this. I, we've seen this. Similar request to this coming through quite a bit recently and. So I'm generally not, um, uh, I, so I generally support more density and building more housing. I, I still, this, I think points to my concern about how we don't have a zoning district that gets to that, um, correct scale of housing. Like our multifamily zones are not, um, serving our needs well and so the next best request that the applicants can ask for is form base two however i don't think form base two is necessarily appropriate in in situations uh, it's really intended for places where you have really good access to transit not that this area does not it does have access to transit but um i i i think in order to allow projects to move forward, we, we have in the past approved similar zones, similar rezones to form based urban neighborhood 2. Um, and I think it's likely that we'll do the same here, but, um, I, I would really like us to, uh, continue to focus on actually getting a better zoning ordinance that allows for these types of projects um and rather than just trying to fit kind of a square peg into a round hole with uh what is either very progressive zoning ordinances like the form based zones or really regressive ones like the rmf zones so um i i i'm not sure exactly where we'll go with this one but i imagine it'll go the same way that the other ones have gone and and I think that's given the tools that we have right now, that's probably the best thing to do. But 
Um, I, I hope that we can expand our toolbox as quickly as possible. And thank you very much for that uh, comment and that push to increase our toolbox. Thank you. And we'll move on to, I have no other further comments. We'll move on to item number. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Sorry. Mr. Chair, I believe the applicant is on the line. If they would like to. Okay. Say anything. Uh, I can, I can say something really quick. If, if you all can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you and you, and you think you have. Uh, two minutes or five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um. You know, you guys uh, collectively pretty quickly hit on, you know, what have largely been the concerns with, with our request here that, that we've heard from the community. Uh, just as some quick backstory, um, you know, we're partnering with the current owner of Western Gardens. They're looking to retire out. So, you know, we're not trying to come in and, and, and buy out uh, an existing business and replace them with multifamily. They're, they're looking to close the store and transition out. Uh, you know, the, lar the largest feedback we've heard is, is sadness that Western Gardens will leave. So, um, but, you know, we're partnering with that owner, trying to move it forward. Um, you know, largely the feedback we've gotten and, you know, we've had a couple of community council meetings and, and a planning commission meeting and historical landmarks meeting. Uh, support for multifamily as a use here has been pretty strong. We haven't, you know, really received any feedback that that doesn't make sense. I think the, the main discussion has been around, you know, scope and scale, uh, largely the height and the setbacks, like, like you, uh, you know, brought up here. Uh, we originally uh, came and requested RO for this site, went to a community council meeting uh, and, and got some, I think, negative feedback that, that a higher height allowance there didn't make sense with the, the character of the neighborhood. Uh, planning kind of confirmed that feedback as well. And we, we backed it down into to FBUN2. Um, FBUN2 is four stories and, and 50 feet, as was mentioned. Um, it also has uh, some step back requirements when it butts up against residential uh, neighbors. So, you know, to the south and to the west are, are kind of 35 foot residential neighborhoods. It's required that, you know, beyond the setback from that property line, you also have a kind of tiered step back such that against any of those property lines, you can really only have kind of two or three story, um, you know, uh, buildings that go against the residential there. And from, from our end, you know, when you look at how this site is, is surrounded, you have kind of commercial uh, to the north with some four story apartment product, uh, some office buildings uh, of a historic nature. And then to the west and south, you transition to the more kind of historic uh, single family neighborhoods. and. and our thought was that the the phrasing for FBUN2 fits really well as a transitional um, uh, a transitional zoning here. Uh, a couple of other things that are particular for this site is that it's at mid block and it's really wide and deep, such that you can't really place just like a big block of apartment building in the middle of the site because of fire department access. So you kind of have to break it into two, uh, which we think will naturally lend itself to you know a more neighborhood feel as you as you look at this site and what gets built there. Um, you know, there's a high water table underneath, so you can't go super deep. Or parking, so it also has a natural limitation on, on how functional you can build it out that way. Um, and, and another thought from our end, just at a high level, is you know we're not removing any historical uh, buildings. It's an historical neighborhood, but there's no contributing structures, and, and we're not looking to remove any existing housing. And so, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it makes sense for multifamily. I think you all hit on it right away. I mean, the real discussion is about you know what the right scope and bulk and scale of that building is, and. Uh, you know, the fact that we're in that historical landmarks district really provides another layer of oversight to particularly what we can do here uh, that I think should should provide some comfort to uh, hopefully the city council and to the neighbors that, you know, we're going to have uh, pretty tight guidance on uh, on what we can do. And, and when we went to discuss this with the historical landmarks commission, that was their exact feedback. They're like, you know, we see, we understand this as a use there. Um, but, you know, we're going to be focused on height and scale and bulk when it comes through. So I think they confirmed the, the expectation that, that, you know, that's the process that we'll go through. But uh, we appreciate you listening to it. Um, you know, we're, we, we love that neighborhood. We want to bring housing to that neighborhood and we want to be respectful of the neighbors. So, you know, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Tyler. Appreciate that. Sorry, Brian, I have one more question that I just thought of. What's the height restriction of the current? zoning ordinance there as far as it and the 
scale of what they can build. The neighborhood commercial, I believe, is 35 feet. I think it's 25 feet. 25, yep. okay. And is there a minimum parking on that? Uh, there is a minimum parking requirement in the CN. One one quick note, if I can interject, though, is CN doesn't allow multifamily. Yeah, I understand that part. I'm just saying if it was current. So thank you, Tyler. So 25 feet, but also there would be a parking minimum there. Okay, if it was just if you were just to leave it at current CN, no no uh, housing, but 25 feet, and it could be uh, whatever the setbacks are as far as a building block is concerned. Go ahead, Nick. Housing is allowed if it's part of a mixed use development. Okay, but it's not allowed as a standalone use. Okay, but and still with a limit of 25 feet, whether it's housing, okay. So there is mixed if it's mixed together, but not as a standalone with the current zoning. Okay. And at 25 feet. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Appreciate that, Brian. Thank you. Tyler, Nick, Amy. We're good. Thanks. We have a break at uh, 445, but I think we're going to go. Let's uh, go to the next item number eight, the informational. Wait a second. Sorry, sorry. I'm skipping one. <laughs> I was trying to skip the longest one and the most in depth one. That isn't going to happen. Sorry, we're going to item number six, the one year action plan for the community development block grant, CDBG, and other federal grants for fiscal year 22 to 23. At the table, we have Mr. Ben Lucky, Tony, welcome, and Heather, come on board. And it's all yours. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, before we get started, I just want to make sure all the council members have their hard copies of the funding log and then the shorter combined scores. Okay, can you give us a 30 second break so we can uh, go get our copies? Certainly. And if anyone needs extras, I made sure there's uh, extras on the front office counter for the public or council members. I think. Okay, so we need at least two sets. <laughs> All right, Ben. Ben, your your class is is uh, now prepared for its lesson. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is the first briefing on the annual HUD grants, and there is a public hearing tonight on this topic. As a reminder, there are four separate grants. We can't shift funding between the grants but you can shift funding between the applications within each grant category with some limitations. The most common limitation is the public services category of CDBG. This is the category with the most number of applications, but per HUD rules, it's limited to 15% of the total annual award. And the administration and board's recommendations 
do max that out at 15%. So if you're shifting funding within public services, it has to come from another application in that same category that's recommended for funding. The city has a five-year consolidated plan that sets out the goals and strategies that need to be advanced by each of the applications for these four grants. And on the last page of the funding log, that's the thicker of the two, it lists out what those five goals are and each of the individual supporting strategies. If the city were to award funding to an application that did not advance one of those goals, it could have negative consequences in HUD viewing the city as underperforming they could audit the city or they could decrease future grant awards. So it is important that the city fund uh, qualified applications so we can report that progress to HUD each year. I also wanna point out that on page three of the funding log, there's a section called neighborhood improvements. This is transportation related and economic development related. And you'll see a note in blue that those are limited to a geographic target area. It's the only section that is limited to that target area, and the target area is attachment three, and we can put it up on the screen later if we need to reference it. Mm -hmm. yep. Correct. Taylor, would you put up the table on page one of the staff report, please? The amounts that are listed as available are estimates. We're currently waiting for HUD to confirm the actual grant awards. Uh, there is a good level of confidence in these estimated amounts, and it's not uncommon at this point for the city to be waiting for HUD to finalize the amounts. So as we're going through, keep in mind that over the next few weeks, we may get the finalized numbers. They could be a little higher, a little bit lower. We'll let you know as soon as HUD tells us. Uh, the staff report page one, Taylor, not uh, attachment one, sorry. And while he's pulling that up, if it, come, if it happens to come in higher or lower, do we have a strategy for how these things get adjusted? Yes, good question. The two advisory boards, um, there, there's two different advisory boards, but they both provide recommendations what to do in case the funding is more or less than requested. Uh, the staff report summarizes those changes and the advisory boards call out specific applications that should get more or less and be used to balance. And then if you can zoom in, Taylor, on the table, the lower half of that page. So this is a summary table. It shows the amount of requested funding, the amount of estimated available funding, and the percentage difference. And as happens almost every year, for most of the grant categories, the requests are significantly more than what's available. This is especially true in ESG, the Emergency Solutions Grant, which has one of the greatest needs, but the smallest amount of available funding. This grant is focused on homelessness. In happier news, the HOPWA grant, the Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, it actually has more funding than what was requested. That is an unusual situation. And you'll see that one of the applications for HOPWA is actually recommended for double the requested funding because there was some remaining. The HOPWA grant for the city has actually more than doubled in the last seven years. So every year this grant has been growing, so we've had more funding to put to this community need. That has not been the case for the other three grants. Are there any questions on the specific amounts before we keep going? Okay, you can take that down, Taylor, thanks. There is a- Hold on one second, Ben. Yeah. Uh, Councilman Romano, if you have any questions or comments, just go ahead and shout out because we're not going to always see your screen pop up. Okay, thanks. There is a minimum grant award that the city has established of $30,000. 
Uh, this is a recommendation by HUD that there be a minimum amount. And the $30,000, it's actually a little less than HUD's original recommendation. That was determined after discussions with the applicants who we frequently see every year. The minimum award allows the city to balance the need to recognize the cost it takes to administer the grants, because it does take city staff time to track and report and make sure it's all in compliance as well as the recipients of the grants have to go through work on their end. So we're balancing that burden with making sure the dollars create a real public benefit out in the community as well. There are a couple of trends on the funding logs to point out. Uh, this year, the advisory board and the mayoral funding recommendations are identical for all four grants. So they're one in the same this year. That's not always the case. There are new applications, and in particular, 10 of the new applications have funding recommendations. And those 10 are listed in the middle of page two of the staff report. There are also seven returning applicants. These are applicants that received funding in the last few years, but this year they are not recommended for funding. So those organizations, if they are not awarded the funds, it could be uh, a hit to their service levels or their budgets if they had assumed this funding. Uh, those are listed at the bottom of page two of the staff report. And then could page two of oh, the staff report, I'm looking at the hard copy, sorry. The, it's not on the... Nope. Yeah. I can, I can, if we want to go through them, I can call them out or we can yeah. put them up on the screen. If you, whichever, can you call them out and then we can mark them down? Yeah. Just so we can. So the seven that are returning that are not recommended for funding, uh, they are CDBG public services number three. Oh, you're going to have to. I'll give you the page numbers. So it starts on page four, and it's, if you look on the far left side, there are individual numbers. So number three, this is Community Development Corporation Housing Counseling. And then the next one is on page six. And it's application number 18, the in-between end-of-life care and medical respite. That's correct. So, yeah, we didn't fund this last year, but we did in years prior to that. That's correct. Okay. And the council made a one-time appropriation. I think it was $30,000 from the general fund. Uh, to recognize that they weren't getting the funding that was requested. We did, we uh, did fund that. We did fund the in between last year. We funded them out of the general fund. Out of the general fund. Okay. Gotcha. That's, that's what I thought. That was 2 years ago though. Right. Yeah, I and think it was, we two didn't. Years ago, right. yeah, it felt like last year. Okay. Yes. Well, it actually felt like 10 years ago, but yes. And last year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next one is right below that. It's number 19, the Road Home Gail Miller Resource Center. And the one after that is on the next page, page seven. And it's number 25, the YWCA Utah Women in Jeopardy program. And then there's two more, which are in the next grant. So it's on page nine of the funding log. And it's application number one, Catholic Community Services, the Wiegand Homeless Resource Center Client Intake Operations. And then the last one is on the same page, still page nine. 
application number seven, the Road Home Gale Miller Resource Center. Is missing one. Right? One, two, three. Oh, you're right. We are missing one. It is page 10. And it's ESG part two. So it's the lower part of the page. And it's the first application from Utah Community Action, their diversion program. And can I ask, are the new state funding for homeless, the, uh, does any of it cover any of these programs? The Homeless Shelter Cities Mitigation Grant, is that what right. you're thinking of? The, from the state, is that, are they able to apply to that funding or is that just going straight to the cities? So that funding goes to the cities, not to the service providers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, were the changes on the last seven, were those just because of the scores or were there additional considerations? So I would defer to hand staff since they were part of the advisory uh, groups that went through and made these recommendations initially and reviewed the applications in detail. Uh, can you tell me about the seven that we just went through? Yeah, so I can speak to that. There's a number of diversions from the board scoring of the applications to their recommendations. That was due in part to a couple different things. The first of those being there are a few agencies that submit multiple applications for the funding under different the various different funding sources and the board really wanted to be able to provide opportunity for newer agencies to build capacity and be able to provide services. Um, and so there is some variation there. The other one of those things that they considered is a number of these applicants also received funding under some of these other funding pots as far as recommendations go. So they were just trying to spread it out a little bit, particularly for CDBG public services and ESG part one, which are the most competitive. Yeah, because I noticed we're, there's one for the Wiegand Center that we typically fund that we're not funding. And then there's a new one from the Wiegand Center that we are funding. Is that because they're covering something similar? Yeah. There's an overlap there. Okay. Yep. So they really were trying to, instead of only funding the same three agencies year over year, which they expressed concern about, uh -huh. they were trying to um, provide opportunity for some new organizations to be able to build their capacity and provide services. Mr. Chair. Sorry. Um, as a nonprofit professional, a few red flags get raised with these possibilities and like double dipping and double charging for the same services. Not okay. Um, I'm assuming that our application process screens for that, that we have rigorous, they have to provide financial, like audited financials. They have to provide board approved budgets, all of that. And, and we've got good safeguards in place. So they do yes to all of those things, but. Um, the board has also expressed concern that our scoring criteria boxes them in a little bit because it looks for very specific things, which really um, pertain specifically to the quality of the applications themselves and then the agency's documented capacity for administering federal funds. So they, we have met with the board since then to talk about ways we can improve that process so that they can provide the opportunity through their scoring to some of these newer or smaller agencies in order to be able to do that. Um, it's this balancing act we have between <laughs> providing opportunity for new agencies and then also as the stewards of the public funds, ensuring that they have the organizational capacity to administer those effectively. I so appreciate you all being on that. Like this is the equity debate in the nonprofit sector right now, how to do this. And I appreciate you taking that complexity on. No, and additionally, so with the application portal, they all have to uh, upload all their information, their budget, their all their details, audited financials. We actually make that available to council staff at the, to the council as a read-only 
file to be able to go in and actually read the actual applications for each applicant, um, if that's of any help. But then we also, the staff turn around and do a admin review before we then get, put it forward to our resident advisory boards who are looking for basically, do they have the capacity? Is this a legitimate program? Is this a plausible program? Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit more about, um, I think it's number 25, the um, YWCA one? YWCA under CDBG Public Services? Uh, yes, for the Women in Jeopardy program. It's the bottom of page seven. Yeah, that was really just based on their scoring and they ran out of money. So they the board didn't have any specific comments about that application that were negative or concerning. They just, again, this is the most competitive pot of money. And so they really, to the greatest extent, feasible and reasonable, they try and stick to the scoring, but this year they did, as you see, try and spread that out a little bit as well, but there wasn't any concerns mentioned. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Teacher, I have a question on, so there's two, um, page number two, let's start with number four. Um, that says Salt Lake City Housing Stability Division. Um, and then you have a West Side Node Improvement Project. What is that? What would a West Side Node Improvement Project entail? Number four, the Rehabilitation and Home Buyer Program. Yes. So this isn't a, uh, an existing program that's run in house. Uh, in the housing division that basically uh, does targeted repairs for low income households who qualify. Uh, for a while, we've been working off of a west side node to basically really try to go like, you know, target as, as targeted as approach as possible, basically knocking on every single door in those neighborhoods to then offer those services, explain to them their options, uh, the, re the resources that the city has to offer, but then other community resources as well. I get confused because usually when I talk a lot of notes, it's commercial. So I'm like, but really? That's cool. What is this about? <laughs> anyway, in number five, um, housing stability division. And so um, targeting qualifying seniors um, and persons with disabilities. So is this competing with assist? Does it assist to similar work as that, as what you're proposing here? They do do similar work. They're not in direct competition with each other. Oftentimes we end up working hand in hand with assist okay. where we pick up where they can't, they pick up where we can't. And so it's kind of a partnership that we have. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other further questions before I continue, Ben? All right. Oh. Sorry, oh, same question for me with regard to number six. Does that, that one's also not, not competing with each other? No, so with NeighborWorks Salt Lake, so they kind of do, again, they target Guadalupe area, West Side area as well. Uh, they've kind of gone different programs throughout the year, mainly just uh, home buyer assistance programs, also includes down payment assistance. This year, they really put forward, though, just one, to, it's kind of a newer program for both uh, rehab. So they haven't really been doing too much of rehab and improvements. So this is the first year that they actually put that one forward. Right. And, but that's, that's what I mean is like, that's their rehab program isn't, isn't going to be competing with or doing the same thing as our rehab program. Mainly because they focus on the West side. Okay. Where ours, uh, the sit for the city is border to border. Okay, the you. other differentiator there is that they will do larger repairs, whereas the number five is targeted small repairs. Right. So it's also the scale of the repair or rehabilitation that they will do in their program. Thank you. Uh, next, 
I wanted to show the council a quick chart. Taylor, can you screen share the chart on page three of the staff report? I uh, thought it'd be helpful to take a moment to step back and take a look at the CDBG money for housing. Uh, several years ago, the council set a policy goal, which remains today, that affordable housing funding is very important for the city. And in the chart, it shows the amount each year from CDBG that has gone to these housing applications. And it does show that there's been a significant increase over the seven year period. There it is. And as you can see, the increase has been consistent the last four years, noting the current fiscal year are the recommendations before you pending your review and approval. But I thought it was worth highlighting that your policy guidance is reflected in the higher housing funding over this time period. And the total amount of funding over those seven years is $11.8 million. So that's significant. There's a few policy questions uh, to highlight. We already touched on the first one about application scores uh, and funding recommendations not being strictly followed. There are a few that um, are an exception. The other policy questions are about uh, HANS Home Development Program. That's the third application in home. The question is how this home development fund fits into the council's policy goal of having a one-stop shop for all affordable housing development, which is in the RDA. Hold on, uh, direct us to what page? <laughs> a, yep, page 12. Page 12. And it's the third application. Thank you. The other policy questions oh, yeah. are about the ballpark. And this one is uh, not just for HUD, but kind of a larger question about the city's overall strategy for funding improvements to the ballpark and the surrounding area. Uh, there's a list of five different funding requests that have come to the council for this overall improvements to the ballpark. And each of the requests is, is a bit general, uh, an exception being the one for tracks stop improvements in CDBG this year. Uh, the city has a draft uh, ballpark station area plan that is gonna go to the planning commission next, and then ultimately it will come to the council for review and approval. That plan will have an implementation section with recommended changes. So there are five funding requests that have come to the council for implementing things coming out of that future plan. And it's a question if you'd like to discuss with the administration that overall funding strategy and how this application for the track station improvements fits into it. Um, this is something that we have been uh, working with the administration on. Uh, we, the council set up a, a unofficial system, so to speak, where you ask to um, have master plans come to you when they're initiated and midway through uh, once or twice. And then, of course, after the planning commission, uh, unfortunately, just based on timing and um, demands and that type of thing, this you have not received one of those types of updates on this ballpark plan. So it's especially valuable to have those updates because of situations like this. So I don't know if you want to ask for that update before you finalize this, or if you um, want to just have the, I, I don't know what you want to do. <laughs> but I know that they're going to try to get that to us, but it's not clear to me when. So the question is, do we move forward or we want to have the update first? It'd be kind of nice to probably have an update so we can kind of see it all at one time. So we'll coordinate with the administration since the current schedule is to have the final vote on April 19th, so we can look at having that discussion at one of the April briefings. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
The last two policy questions are about encouraging more applications for behavioral health and mental health. This was one of the new goals and strategies that was added in the five-year consolidated plan. There are four applications this year, which is an improvement over the previous year, uh, but perhaps there could be further education and awareness to get even more applications for that goal, especially since a big part of the behavioral health issue is the ongoing and worsening opioid epidemic. And it's also, I think, you know, we went to back to DC and we talked to our congressional delegations and one of our comments and requests was some more support for mental health because of the issues surrounding that and the vulnerable population and stuff. So anytime you have more applications and more requests, it, I think it kind of uh, it hopefully elevates your, your need so that possibly get more funding. So I would love to see more applicants so we can kind of boost that need that we have in the city. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and I'm happy to speak to that. We actually have done quite a bit of outreach. We even partnered pre-Omicron with the county at a engagement that they were doing for community partners to get the word out about um, CDBG funding in particular. But we did talk with them about all the different funding sources that we have um, and the uses that they can go toward. So we have seen an increase in some of those requests. We continue to work with our community partners and share broadly. Um, there's a limited number of community partners that provide those specific services for the clientele that we need the LMI, the low to moderate income population that we are targeting. Um, but we're happy to accept suggestions always and make improvements where we can. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is really the only place that that a funding request is appropriate is within CDBG public services, which is already the most competitive pot of funding we have. The one exception to that would be the HOPWA program, which is specific to those living with HIV and AIDS. So, but we're, we're happy to take suggestions. Thank you. Uh, the last policy question is about the potential for grant funding uh, working with the city's Fix the Bricks program. Uh, since that program was recently transferred into hand, uh, there was a thought from an earlier briefing about using those funds as a match for low and moderate income homeowners who otherwise would struggle to provide the 25% cost share the grant requires. I'm not sure if that's something that we need to look further into. I know there is some concern about having federal funds as a match for a program that's largely funded by the federal government. Uh, sometimes they require the federal government requires you to use non-federal funds as a match to a majority federal funded program. I'm getting a look that says that's probably the case. And so we are, we recently, because I actually, because Councilman Wharton actually brought this up last year to say, and we kind of left it at, We'll look into that, whether or not we can use, utilize CDBG funds for low-income households for that 25% match of the Fix the Bricks program. Uh, in, as we've been transitioning the program from emergency management over to uh, the housing division, we've realized that it's very clear that that says you can't use federal funds for that 25% match. So our goal moving forward is to kind of continue to work with our state FEMA representatives to come up with possible solutions, actually reach out to others around the country who do similar programs using FEMA dollars to then figure out what uh, possible private dollars can be utilized or sought after or grant written for, you know, specifically to help low income households. Thank you. So on the, you know, I guess I have many questions of fix the bricks in the past. I, uh, you know, I'm learning a lot about the program. Um, I, and I'm learning that we're behind on uh, several years behind on this program. Uh, for multiple reasons, but um, I'm wondering if there are ways to tweak the program based on income. Um, so we we're not spending this money on people that could potentially pay for this themselves, and we are using uh, you know this fund fund more targeted in air in on on families on houses uh, or families that cannot necessarily afford this. 
uh, is there any way to include into this program some income um, component to it? And I don't know. This is the time for this conversation, but I, you know, I wanted to make sure that this is this is how I, you know, I'm feeling about it because maybe maybe through the applications we find out that many of them don't necessarily they may want some direction about how to go about this, but they might not need the funds. Um, and I don't know if this is too late, you know, since there's many years of applications there and, you know, we are changing the, the rules of engagement after the fact. I don't know what that, how that works, but um, I just wanted to throw that there and if the, if, see if there is a way to, to do this. Thank you. Some of the things that we've been working on as we bring over the fix the bricks program is to one just understand the district, the geographical distribution of the applicants of who actually is applying, let alone who's actually being received receiving the program. Plus those on the waiting list. So we're really trying to then put that onto a map to really understand where get definitely back to the the wait list as well. But that's something that we'll work with can and the administration to really see what we can get our hands around. Yeah, and I and I wanted to say, let's make sure that we don't use, um, and I'm not sure that this is true because I don't have any data, but lower applicants on the west side as a sign that there's less people interested in this program. Let's let's make sure that we remember uh, the circumstances and the background and the issues uh, to access information and to and uh, you know and to apply. There's many barriers, and we take that as a consideration for this program. I believe, um, you know, that there are many, many families on the West side that could, if they knew, um, they will be interested in this, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Councilman. We'll take that in consideration. Thank you. Go ahead, Cindy. So I just want to be sure we understand. So you would, you would like to have sort of an income qualified situation with this uh, program and your question is, can that be done based given that some people have already applied? Certainly, it can be done prospectively. Um, and so, your request is that we come back with that something that would allow for that, and also evaluate the back the the backlog to see whether it could be applied in that in that way. Okay. All right. So, well, I, mean, I know you said that, but, no, no, but it, good. but it's not that you're asking for uh, them to consider that or evaluate it. You're asking for that to be um, provided to the council for consideration. Okay. Thank you. So that was everything I had as a in. A lengthy intro, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, at this point, we typically would go uh, either page by page uh, just to see if council members had any questions on applications on that page or if they wanted to flag an application they're interested in funding that wasn't recommended. Uh, another approach is to just open it up if council members already want to call out additional applications. We, we can do that. We could we could do that. We could uh, hold on just one second. So. Either go page by page, starting with the sh the uh, the first ones. This first the uh, two pager. So page one. Uh, yeah, we could either do the shorter one, the summary log. Uh, we could just go down that list, or we can do page by page of the longer full log, whichever you prefer. Since let's just go through this one right here, and we're just because they're all in these are all listed with just more detail in the in the log. So we'll just start it from the I think the top two should just from the uh, the public service ones because I think that's where the most of the discussion would be. Start with the donated dental. Sorry, this page. My overwhelming impression of this funding, looking at this, is that. We've narrowed the homelessness crisis and our response to it away from any extenuating factors that we know will continue to be exacerbated. We are There's a remarkable lack of emphasis on domestic violence. And if we decide that's a priority this year, like I'm cool, I could be convinced into it, but I do worry about that as a general trajectory, especially given the high quality outcomes we know the YWCA provides to our community year in and year out. Um, and 
especially knowing that some of these other names literally show up in every bucket of funding, in ongoing funding. It, it, I, I understand the stresses and I'm not necessarily calling it out, but I do think it warrants a little bit of evaluation and discussion if this is a unique priority year or if this is something we might want to adjust. Thank you. Go okay, ahead, so, Councilman Von So I guess what you're saying is that you would like the WYCA to be back on the table for funding. Well, it's not just them. If we look at, uh, sorry, I'm having a hard time connecting these across, but South, South Valley Sanctuary, they, they are getting some, but the DV case management is only getting half of their request and it's on par with you know, the amount that we're giving to other places to do the things that we already fund them doing. Um, and we know that DV is a persistent contributor to homelessness. And so I just, I just worry that our lack of attention to it could inadvertently be setting us up to have a bump next year in, in homelessness resulting from this and exacerbating the crisis in ways we didn't intend. May I? Is that okay? Um, just, there were a couple of abbreviations there that you used that might be lost on the people at home. So you're saying that the domestic violence uh, area that isn't emphasized here and that does, it also c contributes to homelessness in some cases? Yes, we're, I mean, we, we've, we've long understood the need for domestic violence violence shelters for women oh, and children, I see, I see. Okay. right? Um, okay. All right. And so so you, beyond so, even like the opioid epidemic or COVID-19 or rising rental prices, we know that DV is going to be an ongoing source of housing instability that we as a community have historically invested in. Got it. And then- I Don't feel comfortable not doing it right now, but I, I get our restrictions. Okay. So- so you would like those things to be lifted up and discussed further? Yeah, I mean, is anyone else feeling this or is this just my gut? Like my gut just is uneasy with the disproportion. Good. I mean, I, I relate to that point very much so because we are funding many of these organizations that they do so much work, but we also funding them from other funds uh, through the city. Uh, many of these organizations are not getting those funds through other parts of our budget. so. I think that's that's a it's a it's a discussion we should have. Yeah, and and part of the, part of the discussions, and we've had this in the past too, is that I've had some questions about other services that are like, wow, the the score is really low. I think their services should be higher, and part of it was that their application was poor. So we worked with them on. As supply. someone who writes her own grants, I tend to give grace to the way grants are written and look for the substance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think I think they do also the same thing. So they they balance that all out. And part of it was that we'd help them write their grants too. So it is. If I I totally I understand because you're right. Uh, they have asked for two hundred seventy thousand, and we get fifty to the to domestic violence. Is there a better balance? Is there other way to do that? The and that part, is. And and Ben. And staff help me. Am I missing other domestic violence funding? I, as far as I can see, this fifty thousand is our contribution to housing instability caused by domestic violence in this granting period. Here with South funding South Valley Sanctuary. Yes. Yes. That that seems way too disproportionate to me out of this pool. And again, unfortunately, both applied under CDBG Public Services, small amount, very competitive. I would just add for context, the, the PD has reported that domestic violence cases increased during the pandemic the last two years. Again, it feels disproportionate. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Councilmember Mono, go ahead. Uh, first of all, Councilmember Pietrasco, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's a, this is an important discussion. Uh, two things come to mind. First of all, am I incorrect in remembering that we fund a through the general fund uh, an allocation to YWCA, or am I thinking of something else? You you might be thinking of the Rape Recovery Center, which was Rape previously funded okay. in um, CDBG, but is now an uh, ongoing line item in the general fund. 
Okay, and that's not through the YWC. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for that cl clarification. I think, is there something in the way that we've set up the five year action plan that has not maybe not emphasized these providers that are um, providing services to domestic violence victims uh, to the degree that they should be? Is that something we need to review in the um, in the five year action plan the next time it comes up, and I think it's probably not for a few more years, right? So, but uh, it, it, is that where we made the mistake, or what are um, because it seems like the scores are based on criteria that we set up every five years, and if things that are important are consistently scoring low, it, is that because we've set up the criteria incorrectly and that needs to be reviewed? And is there an opportunity to review that? Or do we have to wait until the five year HUD um, five year action plan comes up again? And please remind me when that is. I think it's probably three or four more years. We're we're halfway through the five year plan. The the plan can be amended part way through. I think it was done once under the previous five year plan. It it, it is a lengthy process. I I'm guessing it would take at least half a year to, to go through that. I, I'm looking at the last page of the, the full funding log where it has the goals and the strategies. I don't see domestic violence specifically called out. There are a number of strategies that it could be considered part of, uh, but I don't see it specifically called out. My concern is that we know that part of a, a great contributor to the housing instability, which is the priority, is domestic violence. And we seem to be dancing around the same factors that we're always dancing around with the other centers and intentionally not paying attention to a known persistent ongoing cause. Um, and so if we have a complex homelessness situation, our response has to be complex as well. And by not intentionally addressing domestic violence caused homelessness, we are withdrawing attention from a part of our constituency that desperately needs us. Could, uh, could I? Uh, could I, well, I just, I, I total, totally agree. Um, I don't think any, I don't think anybody would say that we disagree with that, but it's where else do we want to pull from? Uh, I, I have one idea, but go ahead. <laughs> no, Mr. No, Mr. Um, you know, um, the there is a line item that shelter the homeless, the homeless resource centers meals, mm -hmm. and it's fifty seven thousand um, dollars that it's been allocated. And I think, I mean, I, I know there are other resources out there that could easily get fifty seven thousand dollars for meals. Um, I know the LDS Church uh, with Welfare Square. They are very um, generous uh, with uh, some of the shelters in our in our city, and so and I'm sure if there was another campaign to f you know to find funding for meals, I'm sure people will be very excited to donate to this. So maybe um, not to take all of it out, but maybe a, a portion of it, and then move some of that to the WYCA. The other line item I would point to is that uh, the case manager at Catholic Community Services, the request was at 50. If that if, if they are intending that we underwrite one position at that rate, I worry that we are not going to get quality people in that position and us contributing partially to it could further undermine that position and not use our dollars dramat dramatically enough. So I would contend that our 35,000 to Catholic Community Services is not going to get the impact that we want at this rate. And I would support moving at least part of that to domestic violence services as well. So, so some of these, I think we're just, we can capture these questions because these are questions for, uh, for the discussion. Because I think part of what we're seeing, hearing is, and we had this, the same, same thing occurred last year, was, you know, limited funds, a lot of programs, a lot of uh, heart-wrenching decisions to be made, and uh, how we balance that funding. Uh, because it is a heart wrenching process for everybody across the board. Uh, so I, I think, think these the are, question is, though is just magnifying the impact of right, every dollar. Right, right, we, right. Impact and exactly. So uh, we need to review some of these ideas, and there's probably some more uh, 
to go around because I, I have another question, but go ahead. So quick, I, I think you mentioned this, uh, Ben, um, it, or uh, was or someone else maybe? I, it was was it thirty thousand dollars the amount that is recommended to not go under? I said like a, correct thirty thousand dollar minimum. Thirty thousand, and that is still low. They probably prefer a little higher than that, right? Yeah, HUD recommended thirty five thousand, but based on our based on engagement that hand staff did a couple of years ago. 30,000 for our community was considered more appropriate. Okay. So no under 30,000, so, so no water down too much. So it, it actually has some impact, but, but also we need to wait how much they're asking, right? And what the program is, right? Like if they're asking $300,000 and we're giving 30, and maybe that's not the right place to put 30. Okay. Well, thank you. Just because we're giving them 30 doesn't mean that they aren't going to be able to come up with the 20. Yeah. Right. But um, to council member Petro, Petra Eschler's point, I worry about taking away from our shelters after HB 440 when we're going to be having flex days, maybe. Um, so um, that's why I like, I always go for the new categories first um, and the ones that, you know, where we're adding spend or where we're considering spending new money. Um, and and that's why this is always such a hard process is that um, this is the area that has the most need and is the most competitive. Um, so I just want to be clear. I, it's not that I disagree that that's absolutely sh should be a priority and that, that we know that that's a contributor, but we also are dealing with these other factors like we don't know what HB 440 is going to look like now. Um, and I, as far as the, I would be interested to know more about the meals, though, like um, that Councilmember Waldemoros brought up. Is that an area where we think it, that the gap could be filled in? And does the does the board that's making the advisory um, that's offering us advice do they look at things like that too and say, you know, we think that this could could remedy? That? I mean, I imagine they'd have to. To some degree, yes. Um, each of these applicants is required to fill out a budget summary for us, which gives us um, detail for their, the specific program they're requesting funding for overall, what they're requesting from Salt Lake City, what they're requesting from other municipalities, what they receive in private or foundation money, and where each of those um, funding sources is going to. So they some agencies provide a more thorough <laughs> um, explanation of that than others, but they do provide that information, which the board does take into account to some degree. And occasionally that's where you'll see also variances in scoring versus recommendation, where they feel like an agency might be able to make that money up elsewhere. Also, can I add one point of correction and clarification to the DV contribution conversation? Um, I wanted to point out that South Valley Sanctuary is also recommended for funding under the um, home program. So not under CDBG public services, which we're talking about now, but under the home program, they're recommended for funding for their tenant based rental assistance um, in the amount of $138,500. That gives so I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Cindy. Just um, you, this is a great conversation because you're raising important uh, policy issues and you're probably educating us as staff as you do that. So thank you. Um, the, you will, I think, have a, an opportunity to take a look at the comprehensive, the five-year plan. That is for another reason it needs to come to you for some amendments. So you, these issues that you're raising, it isn't, we won't typically, you know, you would wait a little while, but you, in this case, you will have a golden opportunity, I think, to address some of these policy issues that you're raising. So, so we'll, we'll take note of them and then raise them, uh, bring them back to you at that, at that time. So that's it. And I'll also offer, it's kind of been alluded a couple of times that if if uh, council would like to ask staff to do any type of research to basically say if such and such agency was increased or decreased or received no funding, we can follow up with them and then report back at our next briefing. 
I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I do want to just go on, and you kind of touched on it on the uh, South Valley Sanctuary. Did they apply for two different places? And and our, um, and I must also probably assume that when they put an application in, you kind of say, hey, you might want to apply over here because we have more funding or you have maybe other needs that could use some funding too. It's not like they, they just apply for this one and they go, wow, if you just applied you'd, over here, you get the funding. I mean, you, you, I, I'm assuming you already do that with these applicants. Yeah, we work with most of these agencies um, regularly anyhow because they're return applicants, but we do also do an extensive amount of TA during, prior, and during the application phase um, to give them the opportunity to apply for multiple funding sources based on their needs. Okay. You stay neutral. We basically say this is the available amounts. This is what's eligible. This is what you can write for. Sometimes they point blank ask how much I write for. We say write for what the program is that you need. So we try to stay neutral during those technical assistance sessions. Right. I think you gave me that same answer last time because I was like, yes, perfect. I appreciate that because I probably honestly, asked it last time too. Honestly, can we take a moment and, and thank you for running yeah. a really exceptional grant making process? Like as someone who participates in them regularly, I really value all of the work that you've done. Uh, on the, uh, appreciate that. Nice. Uh, back on the YWC, I'm, I'm going back to House Bill 440. Maybe there's too confusing here. But, you know, when, when the w, uh, YWCA talks about domestic violence and overflow support, can they get funding? F uh, do we, is that like a who knows question of can they get funding through that um, overflow shelter because it's overflows on the be beds here? You don't have to, I mean, I'm just. I, I'm thinking that they that the definition of an eligible homeless resource center does not include them is, is my recollection. Cause it, it specifically, if I remember, it specifically calls out the homeless resource centers being like, you know, a minimum number of beds and certain other criteria. Right. So I don't think they would qualify. Okay. Any further questions? I know we'll probably have another discussion on this and we'll go another round. So. Can I Go ask, ahead. Can yes, I ask other council people's input? Uh, acknowledging that the difference between the South Valley Sanctuary request under public services is for case manager and housing assistant, and then their request under home is just for housing assistance, acknowledging that it would be losing a case management position. Would there be any appetite for spreading that 50000 to I? I have no stake in YWCA. I do not know anyone who works there. I've never done anything, but I know by reputation their contribution to the community and do not feel comfortable leaving them out of this. Would would there be any appetite for potentially shifting the public services 50,000 from South Valley to the YWCA and allow South Valley to take the 138 that they'll be getting from home? Acknowledging it is not ideal and no one wants to do it. We could ask can to uh, maybe discuss with the. Is there a nuance in two. the applications that I'm that I'm missing? I acknowledge that we will be taking away a case management position there, but we will still be helping with housing assistance. That's the main. That's the crux of the. We could also ask w, uh, YWCA about if they were to have thirty thousand. Right. So maybe a conversation with them on that type of a possibility. It sounds like it'd be most helpful next time if we can have information for both organizations, what the impact would be. Uh, for example, do they already have other grant funding for these positions and they're trying to get the rest of the funding for it? Uh, we don't know, but I think that's what is being looked for. Okay. Yeah, especially it's since question. it's less than 30% of their ask that we would be supplying. Like, does that help at all? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at the history, too, we've provided that before, and that's helped. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Any further, are we, any further questions? 
at this time. All right. Thank you very much, Ben, Tony, Heather. Appreciate that. Love the discussion and thank you for this work. This is this is good work. Very much so. Appreciate it. Yes, Ben, we got Ben. Sorry, one more question from Cindy. Just based on our progress so far, how many more of these briefings will we need? Did we just get through once? <laughs> uh, ba based on what I've heard, it sounds like there are a few potential funding shifts that we need more context for. We'll have that for the next briefing on April 5th. And I know council member Fowler wasn't here, so I, I was going to reach out to her um, to see if she had anything she wanted to raise or that I could research ahead of time. But with a second briefing on April 5th, that might be sufficient for the council to be ready for a vote on the 19th. Okay, so, so we've, we've gotten through everything one time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ben. Salt Lake City, we're going to take a 15 minute break. We'll be back at, uh. 415, 1615 for, for those who can count to 24. Thank you. City, and we'll continue on with the uh, work session meeting with item number eight, Informational Citizens Compensation Advisory Committee 2022 Annual Report. Uh, at the table and in, in person, we got Deb, David, Ray, and Michael, wonderful. Thank you. Oh, sorry, that's not, not somebody else's. That's good. Take it All away. Right. My name is Ray Shelby. I'm the chair this year of the Citizens uh, Compensation Advisory Committee. Each year, the Citizens Compensation Advisory Committee is responsible for preparing and submitting a written report to the mayor and city council containing, among other things, recommendations on the appropriate competitive position for the city relative to the compensation practices of comparable employees, wages and benefits of the city's elected officials, executives and employees, and general recommendations regarding the mix of compensation for the city's employees, such as base salary, benefits, and incentives. To provide city officials with the most valuable and relevant information, this year's report is more streamlined with a primary focus on the direct impact of current economic conditions on salary budgets and an overview of the city's latest local area market pay analysis. Finally, the end of this year's report includes informational appendices intended to provide city leaders with further insights into key measures and indicators of the city's workforce. I'll start with section one on page two, um, impact of the current labor market and inflation on 2022 salary budgets. As in other years, the CCAC has relied on survey data from World at Work in our salary budget and employee pay increase recommendations to the city. According to World at Work, 2021-2022 uh, 20, salary budget survey, in August 2021, employers reported a 3.3% average, 3% 3 3 median salary budget increases. Due to increasing hyperinflation and extreme recruitment and retention challenges, a World at Work poll taken in December of 2021 revised these estimates to an average of 4% and a median of 5%. Also cited in World at Work reports, Pearl Myers quick poll found that base salaries would exceed 4% for all employee groups. Half reported increases greater than what was expected earlier in the year and 12% expected significantly higher increases. Gallagher's labor market inflation indicators advise salary budgeting in the three and a half to 4% range. Mercer's research found that a percentage of employers re providing increases of three and a half percent or more doubled between its August and November surveys. The committee recommendation regarding overall pay increases 
Considering the impact of the current labor market conditions and inflation on employer salary budgets in 2022, the committee recommends leaders increase the city's all overall salary budget, including employee base wage and salary adjustments at a rate equal to at least 4% average and 5% median. On uh, section two on page three, the local area pay market comparisons. Once again, Pay Factors was engaged to compile the latest sources of relevant market pay data, primarily from local, private, and public employers along the Wasatch Front. City job titles were organized into 99 distinct benchmark groups covering over 1,200 employees, uh, may, uh, adding up to 41% of the city's workforce. To understand how this process works, the benchmark job might be one step of four in a classification. If market pay data determines the benchmark job is below market, all the jobs in that classification should be reviewed for potential pay adjustments. And pay differences between levels should be maintained as well. The results of this year's local market pay analysis are displayed in three separate work groups. This is done not only to account for the differences in each group's unique wage structure, and pay practices, but also to more effectively gauge the city's success at positioning itself as a pay leader. These three work groups include uh, number one, AFSCME, number two, public safety, which includes firefighters, police officers, and public safety dispatchers, and three, non-represented employees. This year, in addition to the pay factors analysis, NFP gave a presentation to the committee on a study they did in January 2022 of the city's non-represented benchmark jobs. NFP's analysis is not part of our report and will be delivered, I believe, after this report. Um, among the recommendations cited in their report, however, NFP concluded the city would be better suited to maintain its competitive advantage by adjusting and setting pay scales within plus or minus 2% of the market base 50th percentile to compete amid the highly dynamic market conditions that exist today. The committee agreed that in today's job market, the previous, our previous standard of plus or minus 5% as a competitive pay position is no longer an effective approach. The committee agrees with NFP's assessment that plus or minus 2% was a more realistic guideline when determining an individual benchmark's jobs co compensation position relative to the market. Therefore, as illustrated in the following spreadsheets, the committee advises a benchmark position is uh, significantly lagging when data indicates the benchmark jobs position relative to market is less than or equal to 90%. And this is shown in pink on the spreadsheets. Slightly lagging when data indicates the jobs position relative to market is between 90.1% and 98%, which is shown in beige on the spreadsheets. Competitive when data indicates the jobs position relative to market is between 98.1% and 109.9%, which is shown in white, and significantly leading when data indicates the jobs position is greater than or equal to 110%, which is shown in green. Employee group findings and overall summary on page five. In this section, for clarity, the benchmark jobs in the spreadsheets are sorted from the most significantly lagging to the most significantly leading. In the interest of time, uh, I won't go over the spreadsheets in detail as they are in the report, but briefly, the AFSCME summary lists 41 jobs covering 338 employees. In keeping with the standards outlined previously, 12 benchmark jobs are significantly or slightly lagging. 16 are competitive and 13 are significantly leading. The public safety summary lists 10 benchmark jobs covering 722 employees. In this category, five are significantly or slightly lagging, four are competitive, and one is significantly leading. The non-represented summary lists 48 benchmark jobs covering 187 employees. 
28 are significantly or slightly lagging, 15 are competitive, and five are significantly leading in this group. The commit our recommendation for this stage, the committee wishes to express its support for the city's compensation strategy to position Salt Lake City as an area pay leader for employees. The committee has long recognized that Salt Lake City employees deal with a volume of diverse situations and problems not seen by most other municipal entities in the state. Therefore, it is in the city's best interest to attract the most capable employees to all positions and encourage them to stay. The committee believes that compensation should be a, an important factor in this equation and that this policy will prove beneficial to the city's citizens in the future. Furthermore, as funds permit, the committee recommends the mayor and city council appropriate financial resources necessary to grant market salary adjustments for employees and benchmark jobs identified in this section as lagging market. First priority should be given to those lagging significantly, and second priority should be given to those lagging slightly behind the market. The, at the end of the report are three appendices. Appendix one on page 11 has data on turnover and retention in the city's departments in 2020 and 2021. Appendix B on page 12 breaks down 2021 information on applicants and hires for union jobs in the city, including how many come from Utah and how many come from out of state. This clearly demonstrates that most applicants and hires in these jobs by far come from the local area. Appendix C on page 13 and 14 gives a detailed account of turnover and hiring on the police and fire departments in 2021. Um, I'd like to thank HR and especially David and Michael for their help in putting this together. Um, that's our report, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, there's people here who <laughs> can probably answer them. Council, any questions? I, ha I have a question. Thank you for the presentation and for the recommendations. I wanted to ask you about um, the market nationwide with the pandemic and all of the revenue losses that we've had, how, every else, how everybody else is doing, um, if you have any recommendations to, uh, you know, to, to balance what we're dealing with reality and also the needs that we have to balance, you know, our, our, our salaries that some of them are not at the right spot. So, uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. I'm sorry. So um, you have, so you have recommendations for us to, to, um, to adjust our salary. Yes, correct? yes, yes. And so that's something that obviously we want to do, but we also face the reality of revenue loss. Absolutely. To, because of the pandemic. Right. Right. And so are there other recommendations that you can help us navigate or think through oh, so I that see. we can make the best decision given the realities that we're facing? That's. That's a pretty involved <laughs> discussion, <laughs> I think, especially. Uh, but it, it's, it's not something we really considered. Okay. At this point, I mean, um, the 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 competitiveness of the job market right now, and especially the local job market, um, was really primary as far as what we okay. considered. That's okay. That's 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 uh, just sorry. I don't know where more help. No, we, we'll talk about it regardless. Thank you. The salary recommendations here are base salary. They're not inclusive of benefit packages or anything else. It that's base salary for your recommendation. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Chair, so I'm looking through the document, and for a minute I thought it was this document, but it is the one. Oh. The so <laughs> we were very confused. I mean, I was very confused, but I found where I was following you at, at some point. But it's, it looks to me that significantly lagging, there's about 400 employees in our city that are at that, what is that color? Fu significantly lagging? No. Yeah. 
Uh, well, yes. Yes, because with the yes. police officers, there is 200 and so, so or, and so that's a lot. I wonder, I mean, I guess we can do some simple math, but I'm not prepared to do that at the moment. But I, um, you know, that is a lot. And, uh, you, you know, almost like what I do for a living is hiring people. I, I, I'm scared of losing, uh, you know, brain capital in our city, yes. you know, and losing them for other municipalities. Now, my question is, when you're talking about market, um, are you talking about, are you, are we considering other municipalities or it's just the market of network engineer number two? It's both. It's, it's private and, and municipalities. Okay. And is, is there any information about like people staying on the public side versus the private side? Because I feel like some employees, if they're staying here for $20,000 less or more, Maybe they have a uh, an interest in serving people. It doesn't mean that they should be paid that low, but it, maybe they want to stay in the public. So can we compare their medium salary uh, market on the public sector? Uh, is there like a breakdown in understanding that? Maybe they want to stay in public sector. Yeah. Maybe the average in the public sector is lower than the private sector. Is there any data on that? Yeah, David, it'd probably be better prepared to answer yeah so we i mean the data that we access i mean we do have the ability to break it down to look at just other public sector entities for example so we we could provide that sort of information too if you're interested in seeing that yeah. but as a whole uh the, the the approach and the philosophy is that we really are competing against everyone that includes both public sector and private sector large and small employers and everybody in between Police officers and firefighters are one of those Correct. different categories where they're, we're not competing with the public sector, right? Like, so the data is heavy on the on exactly. The In that case, it's exclusively other uh, municipalities uh, throughout the state that we compete with. Thank you. So, go ahead, Councilman Romano. Thanks. Um, so, am I understanding this correctly that we have? I think based on our discussions last year determined that leading for public safety, our benchmark is the top rate of the market, whereas for the rest of the city employees, we're still at the 50th percentile is the goal. Now, is that a question? But yeah, am I understanding that right? That we're still, we're still, our goal, our benchmark is 50th percentile of the market for everything I, other than and, public safety employees. I understood the council's goal to be top pay for employees. Uh, period. Uh, certainly for for police and fire. Okay. But I and I and th that may be something that. The council is better prepared to answer. Well, I, no, thank you. I, I do think it's something that we should um, discuss because I know we had that discussion about public safety and we said that we want them to be top period. I'm just looking at the table on page nine of the informational report and it says it's comparing us to the market salary 50th percentile. So that's yeah. where I was getting that information. And I think it's helpful to point out as well, uh, council member, that if you look on page seven of the report, part of the reason why we thought it would be helpful uh, to deliver this information to the committee this way was to separate out the different groups of employees. And so for the public safety group, you'll notice that the comparison references the, the top rate that we pay our public safety employees. And we are in fact comparing that to the top rate of those other municipalities with whom we compete. So in that sense, we are doing a, co a, a top to top rate comparison. Okay. Um, and I don't know if this is the correct place to bring this question up. It's a slightly different, but um, I've been a little concerned about our practice of hiring seasonal employees. I think in a, in a less competitive job market that may have been fine, but right now um, it seems like we're having a really hard time getting seasonal employee people to even apply for those seasonal jobs because they don't want to lose their job for three months out of the year and they do want benefits. So, and I know that's a big cost to the city, 
is this the right time to discuss that? I I understand that it's slightly different for like groundskeepers as as for golf employees, but that the it seems like something we need to discuss is um and just making them full time employees. I think that the parks department also has needs year round, not just seasonally. So um I think that practice is something we also need to discuss. I think, I think this is, I mean, this is a, a survey and, and a recommendation coming from the committee. So I think your question is really like, we should look at that and the, the budget process. Uh, and this is just kind of like the survey, giving us information and giving the admin information on, on what we should look at for uh, our uh, salaries moving forward. And I think your, your, your comment there about seasonal employees and, uh, uh, is really in the, in the budget side of the, the discussion, but it, bringing it up now is 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 great. I think that's very uh, valuable. I think it's sure. also worth noting that our total number of job postings was 510, and we had 17,000 applicants for those positions, mm -hmm. which I think. And that was, they said in 2020, it was 348 as compared to 13,818. I think it's evidence that we have inherited a really great reputation as an employer and a place to be, and it's worth preserving that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good point. I have a question on the, uh, so the recommendation is 4 to 5%, 4% average, 5% uh, median, uh, kind of across the board. Um, now, if we were to do that, is the market basically doing the same thing and we're, we'd be at the same point next year because the market and I, uh, us are going to do the same thing and we're going to still be at the same number lagging, significantly lagging? Well, the, the significant, the, the lagging jobs would, they, they need money to bring them up to to market. The 4 and 5% is what we considered for overall increases. Right. So, that, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. So, I'm going to answer my question after because you just said that. So, my idea is that because 5% median, the, the significant lagging, we're going to increase them by more than that. And the, of course, the significantly leading, we would probably maybe just a slight bump or if, if no bump at all. So you'd end up with a 5% median. Some grand scheme of things. Yeah, and I think you're right, uh, council member, that if, you know, if everybody else does the same thing, then, uh, and there's gonna be differences between what other employers do, but uh, we'll also want to make sure we take into account uh, those lagging jobs because they're going to require more than if we do four or five percent, whatever that number might be. Um, that's why it's helpful to call those out to say we're going to need to do something more here. And on the uh, maybe this is I'm not sure if you covered here. This is part of the budget. Also, is the uh, the lower salaries? Are we assuming that they're they're already bumped up to a living wage at that point, or that's part of the was that part of your survey or did there study at all? We, we've done living wage. Uh, I think this is the first year we didn't include it in the report. And, and Salt Lake City's always been well above uh, the living wage for, for all the jobs that we surveyed. Um, I, that's never been a consideration that I can remember. Even for seasonal employees? Even well, for primarily for the for, for regular full-time employees. For the jobs we surveyed. Okay, okay, for the right for the full time job we service. Okay. For the seasonal employees, that's uh that's different. That's not really covered in this no. uh this uh, survey. Correct, right, not covered. Okay. Any other questions on this survey? Because they're gonna keep the same people at the table and they're just gonna put surveys. I'm looking around. I Go ahead. Just, I, I don't know. They, I was looking at the at page 11, and I think it might be a question for the department, but the the turnover rate uh, 
the attorney's office, when we're talking about the attorney's office, is that the contracted part uh, with the district attorney's office, or we're talking about the our in-house attorney? Uh, is this civil or the, the criminal, criminal side? Um, do we know? I was just like curious about the retention rate yeah. and the turnover, but maybe someone else can help me answer that later. So the breakdown by departments on that chart is actually inclusive of all the employees um, by department. So in the case of the city attorney's office, that would include both the civil and the uh, criminal side. It would also include the recorder's office because they're a division of the attorney's office. There's no further questions. Thank you very much for this. This is wonderful. I appreciate it. Uh, but... Thank you. We're going to move on to item number nine, the non-represented employee salary survey report. Oh, sorry. We got Michael, Mike and Michael. The different yeah, Mike. Deb. Yeah, different Mike. And, there's, and we got Deb in the middle now. Okay, great. I'm in the, I'm in the middle. You got the middle. Yeah. Now, now we're in this one. <laughs> yeah. It's all yours, Deb. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying what a great pleasure it is to be here in person. This is the first time since I came back to the city that I've been here in person and I'm loving it. Um, my role today is a very enjoyable one um, and small. Um, so I'm going to start off by just ensuring that that the council members know who all of our the city's compensation people are, who who we all are that are working on this, because some of us may not have had a chance to meet you all. And so I would start off, and I'm Deb Alexander. I'm the chief human resource officer. Um, I was with the city for eight years, left for a time, and have been back for a year and a half. And on almost every given day, I'm overjoyed to be here. <laughs> um, to my left is the compensation guru for the city. That's really not his title, but we're just making up titles today. Um, David's been with the city for a long time, 12 years, 13? I think I'm a 14. 14 years. He and I actually, when I started at the city, we both kind of came together. And he is the person who is charged with administering compensation. And behind him in the green shirt is our compensation guru, um, second in command, and that's Michael Jensen, who's joined us in the last six months. He, he did compensation previously at the state of Utah, and he's brought enormous, an enormous wealth of experience to us. So we're just, we thought we'd take a minute and tell you who we all were, so you knew. Um, the second thing I need to do is to introduce um, this, this report that we're going to talk about next. Council members may recall that in the budget amendment that I, I don't remember which one it was, probably one that we heard in October, right around that time, there was a funding request from HR to do a survey for our non-represented employees. And that had never been done before. Um, as I recall, we didn't get a lot of questions. Ben did such a good job briefing it that I, I don't remember we were really asked any questions. But in any case, that funding gratefully was, was appropriated. And we are here tonight to tell you what the results of that non-represented salary survey are. To do, to do that for us is Mike Unkinko, who is the managing director of NFP, one of our consultants for all things HR, benefits, uh, compensation, other things as well. And he has a presentation for you, and we're going to just take it from there. Thank you, Deb. Uh, thank you, Council Chair, uh, Mayor. It's uh, certainly a pleasure uh, this evening to be presenting uh, to you. I have quite a bit of information in a slide deck as well as the report in front of you. So um, by all means, uh, please ask away in regards of questions and um, I will certainly answer them. Again, uh, Mike Long Kiko, I'm the Managing Director and I also lead out uh, the HR for the Western Region for NFP. As Deb had talked about, um, NFP um, used to be First West, was acquired by NFP and, and has been here in the state of Utah for almost three decades, um, basically uh, servicing, maintaining, consulting from an HR perspective, retirement, as well as employee benefits. And again, it's been a pleasure. 
uh, my goal here uh, this evening is to um, convey to you the purpose um, of the compensation study. Again, it was uh, the non-representative a subset uh, a group of employees that we went out to benchmark, as well as um, convey to you um, the results. And then also in this very aggressive uh, job market that we're all in, um, and, and as employers, we're certainly feeling the pain, whether you're in the private sector or, or working in the, in the, for a private organization, it is extremely difficult to not only retain, but obviously attract employees. And that statistic that you had mentioned, the number of applicants, you know, really bodes very well specifically for you um, as a city, because it, at least it conveys to me that, you know, the messaging, um, you know, not only to the public, but as well as to candidates is there's purpose here and it's a great place to work. So you're certainly in probably the, the minority where, you know, when we post a position specifically for a benefit benefit position or an account manager here at NFP, you know, we're single digits as opposed to, you know, dozens and dozens of, of resumes um, and applications that have come in. Um, just the goals and scope of the compensation project um, overall um, is, you know, make sure that you're competitive. Again, very aggressive wage inflation, um, aggressive job market, and the market can really slip away from employers if you don't have the, the, the most current data. So that's what we did is we went out, benchmarked positions um, here locally, private and public, and I'll go into detail uh, here in, a, in the next couple slides. But, you know, overall, um, it gives you the data to, to be educated on what needs to be done from a, a, a project plan on bringing up salaries if need be for some of these positions. As I mentioned, um, I know there's, um, you know, 578 active, um, you know, FTEs in regards of non-representative employees. We just benchmarked a subset of that, uh, roughly 64 benchmark positions um, that you will see in this report. And I'll go over uh, this here very shortly. From an assessment standpoint, and I'm on, I think maybe the fourth or fifth slide, I think, maybe slide number five. Sorry, just so you, uh, um, I think, um, yeah, slide before that. Okay. Um, assessment of current um, uh, the city conditions um, from a compensation philosophy, which uh, you know, I was certainly pleased to see that the, the city I know have, have many years have had a formalized strategy and compensation philosophy, which, um, you know, when we do compensation studies and we typically average here locally about a dozen a year, so often, whether they're public or private, there's really not a comp philosophy. There's really not a strategy in how you go about paying employees. Um, the comp philosophy here at the city is pay at market or midpoint for each job and strategically set market pay at the highest wage found via wage surveys and benchmarking tools. And that's certainly a very noble compensation philosophy that at least con conveys to me as a consultant that you're prioritizing employees first in regards to not only budgeting, but how you pay employees. And obviously there's budgetary consequences. Sometimes you're not able to to pay that top wage, for example, for an, uh, when you're when you're competing against um, high tech here um, in, in this valley, but it's certainly a, a very noble strategy to have. And, and it, again, you're paying not really what the midpoint or the market is paying. You're paying above that. And depending on where the analysis, the market pays for each one of those positions, you could be paying, you know, 75th percentile depending on the wage surveys. You could be paying more. Um, or maybe less, depending on the market. But overall, the strategy is you want to pay above and beyond that market uh, for each one of those positions. Um, on the next slide, you can see specifically the number of positions that uh, we benchmark, 64, and they re really range from managers to architects um, to administrative positions. So it was a pretty diverse subset of, of the uh, non-represented positions that we went to, to benchmark. And I think overall, you'll have a very good data set 
when you combine the um, citizen compensation committee, the work that David and Michael has has accomplished last year as well as this year, you'll have a very very complete data set so you can make educated decisions on when you're hiring um, employees here at the city. Uh, as I move on to the assessment of current uh, conditions, just the play plan itself, there's a separate um, pay plan, um, which encompasses the minimum, the midpoint, or what uh, the city calls the city market, as well as the maximum. Uh, there's 32 grades from grades 10 to, to grade 41, and pay ranges um, from minimum to maximum of those pay ranges average um, almost 70%. Um, during our analysis, there were no employees that were paid at the minimum or below the minimum, as well as there were zero employees that were paid at the maximum um, portion of the grade itself. The current landscape um, itself, um, you know, inflation obviously um, is headline news each and every day. Uh, 7.9 is the latest statistic. Um, there's a slide that I have in the slide deck, you know, over uh, 50 years from 1971 all the way to 2021, um, at least headline CPI averages is almost 4%. So I think um, as we came out of the uh, pandemic, um, economists, you know, anticipated that there'll be some sort of inflation um, because of the bottlenecks, um, but I don't think they anticipated obviously a war and they didn't anticipate hyperinflation, which we're obviously in at 7.9%. Uh, so, you know, employees, ex especially some of the lower paid employees are really feeling the brunt of inflation and really has cut into how they're able to spend as well as, you know, if they're receiving increases and if they're not competitive salary increases on an annual basis, you know, it, it, it certainly as well is impactful to them. I had mentioned accelerated wage inflation. Um, you know, the last half of 2021, there were 20 million um, Americans that decided to quit. Some of those obviously didn't come back. Um, you have, you know, the remote workforce. So employees now can be very selective of who they actually can, can work for and work from which obviously has taken, you know, a huge toll and burden on employers that are looking for talent. So obviously it's very competitive. You know, you have um, the, um, uh, the generation that is getting ready to retire um, and they're retiring early. And then you have Gen Z that probably has the highest quit rate, um, you know, uh, of any generation. They're, they're certainly not shy of quitting you know, moving careers, uh, moving from employer to employer, and, you know, they take that risk. And, and you know, that's the, that's the generation that I talked about that there's, you know, they want purpose in their position. They're, they're just not looking for money. They're looking for purpose, you know, in their employer, um, looking for purpose um, in their lives. And um, they're willing to do that and they're willing to quit and go move from job to job. Um, this is probably the most aggressive um, job market I've seen. I used to, um, way back when, in a different career, uh, lead up um, college recruiting for an engineering firm. And that was, unfortunately, at the time, um, during the internet boom, where everybody was looking for engineers. But it, it, it seemed like, at that point in time, employers were just looking um, for engineers or some sort of technical background. This market, I think, is different because it seems like every position that employers are looking towards, whether it's um, entry level, um, mid-career, managers, uh, VPs, um, you know, technical, they're having difficulty trying to source quality candidates or, or just have a candidate pool that they can interview from. So it's, it, it feels different, you know, to me from, um, you know, late 90s where <clears throat> engineers seem to be definitely the cream of the crop in regards of salary. It seems like almost every position title that I've come across that I've dealt with in regards of clients that have, have difficulty and, you know, utilize us almost as a sounding board of what we can do to attract employees 
um, it's just about every position that um, is difficult in, in regards of attracting as well as retaining. I talked about, um, you know, the 7.9 um, inflation. Um, there was a study um, just a few months ago, back in December, from uh, U.S. leaders by the professional service firm Grant Thornton that found, uh, and specifically on base pay, 51% said the organization expects an average merit increase or salary increase, annual increase of about 5%. And I haven't seen that 5% or even 4.5% number for many, many years. It's typically been, you know, annual increases of about 3%, 3.2%, but that was pretty surprising with 5%. And also part of that study was variable pay, where 60% of HR leaders said their company organization had increased the number of employees eligible to receive a cash bonus. Um, and that was also stunning where, you know, employers were being very creative in regards of stay put bonuses, um, you know, um, retention bonuses, uh, sign on bonuses when, when, an, when an employee would um, um, just specifically start from day one, they would receive that money. So it's pretty interesting how creative from a, a variable pay um, employers are paying. Realize from a public sector, that's not um, prevalent. Um, however, as David suggested, you know, uh, Salt Lake City, public entities, they compete not only with public sector, but private sector. You have benchmark jobs, such as an accountant that can go down the street um, to another public entity and obviously a private um, organization and uh, potentially um, make more money or the same money, but at least have total comp in, in regards to their old pay attached to their base pay. So you're also competing with at least additional cash compensation when you're specifically um, um, looking at uh, private organizations as well as public. In regards to the compensation benchmarking um, results, we took four uh, main sources of compensation data. Um, the first was comp analysts, um, benchmarking tool. The second was ERI. Third was pay scale. And lastly, comp data. And from those four sources, we had multiple cuts of data uh, with each in, within each source. We not only source uh, private industry, obviously public entity, uh, nonprofit, uh, but we also slice data regarding revenue size, budget, number of full-time FTEs, and if a data set um, was, for example, in the third quarter of 2021, we made sure we aged the data uh, to present time. The data was also um, cut specifically for the Salt Lake City um, area, region, uh, state of Utah, as well as the Wasatch Front. So we were pretty uh, confident that at least the data set from those four main sources would provide us um, adequate and sufficient data to make decisions, educated de decisions on in regards of pay as well as benchmarking. Um, in regards of the methodology, um, we also looked at total cash compensation. We looked at um, the average 25th base, uh, the average 50th base in regards of total cash compensation and the average 75th base um, and the total cash compensation. So, again, you compete with both private and public, and we wanted to make sure that um, we had a very comp comprehensive overview specifically in regards of compensation in, um, from total comp. We compared um, two Salt Lake City positions. We compared not only to the average, but, but the best practice is the median. And... Um, in this presentation, I'll, I'll talk quite a bit of the base 50th percentile, which is the median uh, for positions um, that we um, uh, benchmark. Before I go on, any questions that I can answer for you? Just point of clarification, yes. the cash compensation, again, is only cash, though. It is not inclusive of benefits, retirement, anything else, correct? Yeah, total cash compensation will include bonuses, variable pay, 
um, those type of things. But no health insurance, no. Yeah, we're just, we're, we're, yes, that's correct. Uh, it does not include employee benefits. Any other questions I can ask, answer, excuse me, before I move on? Okay. Um, in regards of the um, um, compensation summary, uh, summary results, um, there's three main takeaways, or, or really two takeaways, main takeaways that um, the survey represents. And that is when we compared Salt Lake City jobs to the median of our benchmark results, we found that there were 18 jobs out of the 64 that um, were above market midpoint. That is about 28% um, of the jobs that we benchmark that were above the market. There were 12 jobs or roughly about 19% of the jobs that were within the 50th percentile or basically you were paying market. And we use a pretty aggressive number um, when we looked at and defined what market is. Typically in the consulting world, if you're about 5% plus or minus of that midpoint or market, um, you're paying pretty competitively. But what's a job market like it is, we, we ratchet that um, pretty narrow where we considered market as if, if the city was paying plus or minus 2% of that midpoint or market uh, of the published benchmarking results. So you had 12 positions that were 12 jobs that were within market of that uh, tolerance of plus or minus 2% of that 50 percentile or the, or the median. And you had um, 34 jobs or a little over 50%, specifically 53% um, that were below um, the market when we compared it to the benchmark results. Um, it does sound somewhat dramatic and there's certainly positions that were, uh, you know, double digits in regards of below the market. But overall, um, I think both David and Michael and the HR department, Deb has really done a great job in regards of managing um, effectively the compensation structure here at Salt Lake City. So overall, when you compare all the positions and you average just, you know, plus or minus above, below, at market, um, you know, all the positions were only 3.09% below the market midpoint average for all jobs. And then um, just 0.88, excuse me, 0.83% below the market midpoint when they were, when we looked at midpoint to midpoint, uh, 50 percentile, um, those midpoints. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the, here in, in the next couple of slides. Any questions so far on, on just the high level? portion um, in your book you'll in your booklet in front of you you will have every position that we benchmark with all the data set um, there's an explanation of of, um, of what um, we, we specifically benchmark in regards to the date uh, cuts of data the different wage surveys the job descriptions that we compared Salt Lake City's job descriptions to as well as um, gave you a, a quick snapshot at the uh, right hand top corner of whether or not the position was, was either at market, below market, or above market. And uh, as we drill down from an above market standpoint, um, there were um, roughly five positions, jobs that were greater than 10% above market. And that is shown on slide 15. So you have, for example, collections manager, that was about 22%, about 23% above the benchmark results uh, for that market. Uh, collections officer was also double digits. Um, the program analyst too, social work manager and professional land survey, surveyor as well. At market, uh, again, uh, there were 12 uh, jobs that were at market. Um, and then when we look at below market positions, on slide number 16, um, again, there were about 34 uh, jobs, um, a little over 50% that were below um, the very narrow tolerance of, of 2 or 2% 2 or, uh, you know, above or, uh, or below. But we did have about 16 jobs that were greater than 10% below market. And you can't, and those positions are listed on slide number 16. They range from fleet manager, management service supervisor, 
they were uh, that that job was almost uh, a little bit over 27 percent below the market. Uh, to network support administrator, that was um, a little over 10 percent uh, below the market. <clears throat> Again, um, you, you certainly had positions below the market, and that was anticipated considering how aggressive this market has been. Um, it seems like it, it it does change almost on a monthly basis. And some of the data um, that I've had, you know, clients at least talk about, even some of the wage surveys um, that they subscribe to um, can really, um, you know, be behind what this market specifically is paying, this market where they have to rely on at times employees coming in and saying, hey, I just received an offer, this is what it is, and sometimes it's thousands of dollars below, or they're talking to candidates and they're gleaming what the market is paying, um, what their salary requirements are. So again, tough, tough market. Um, in regards of uh, solutions, as well as just some of the administrative uh, recommendations um, from this report, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> um, number one, the first recommendation is adjusting the city's market midpoint. Um, and what we did there um, is we utilized the benchmark, the 50th percentile from the data that we received. And the next couple charts, um, if you want to move on to the next slide, the next couple um, charts um, describes uh, specifically with the positions that we benchmarked and the new midpoints specifically for the city. So one of the things that we also um, added uh, to those midpoints was a 2% um, increase in the, in the market midpoints that we gleaned for the benchmark results. And the reason we did that is because, number one, the market is pretty aggressive, and, and second, by the time budget and salaries um, increases are approved, you're looking you know, towards you know, summer, and um, we wanted to make sure we captured how aggressive the market was here in the next couple months. One of the things that obviously uh, when we did the analysis, when, when NFP consultants did the analysis, um, you know, we, we obviously um, were somewhat in a vacuum. Some of these positions, we obviously didn't have context in regards of um, promotions, even demotions, um, seniority, um, why a position is, is in the range. But we just took that context um, and specifically from the benchmarking, knowing that HR will, will, will certainly uh, review in, in great detail some of those specific positions as related to um, the pay, pay ranges and the new midpoints. When we did um, take a look at all those positions, um, with the new midpoints and to bring everyone up to market, um, whether it was one incumbent, a single classification within, within a single uh, position, or you had seven or eight incumbents within a, a position, that price um, equates to an estimated uh, $1 million, a um, little bit over $1 million, or an average of $5,400 per employee. Just to interject. Council members, um, the one million dollars is for the benchmark studied positions only. There's correct. There's an, and it's it's a thing about compensation that sometimes gets overlooked in these types of reports is that there's a number of positions that are also tied to those benchmarks. And I think in the report it talks about like accountant, like it's it's easy as or easier um, for compensation folks to like go and find out what a pay rate for an accountant three might be. As opposed to one, two, three, four, but once you kind of know what the accounting three person is making, I'm just as an example, you can kind of you can kind of figure out where your what your, what your position is with regard to that. So the million dollars is for the benchmark, the studied positions only. There's a, a great number of positions that are also tied to those, which we can talk about in another setting. But I just want to make sure I brought that to your attention. Thank you for the clarification. That is correct. Again, uh, these calls are just a subset of the non-represented employees. Um, there's obviously um, 
hundreds of other um, non-represented employees that are not in this benchmarking uh, survey that um, HR will have to review and, and uh, slot within the pay range and, and, and market um, specifically. Um, other additional compensation recommendations is to conduct uh, compa ratio and salary range penetration analysis. Obviously in this market, um, small scale um, surveys, I think is, is going to be key if you're losing or having a, having trouble retaining a specific, a specific position or positions, jobs, you know, going out to the market to your peers to see what they're paying um, certainly will be beneficial um, in some of those jobs that you have tendency to lose more often than, than other uh, jobs. And then because of this market, you know, typically, um, you know, we recommend, you know, every three to five years to have a comprehensive um, compensation study. Um, you know, in this market, it may be now every two years um, with uh, frequent small scale surveys with, spe uh, with, the, with uh, specific jobs. And I think HR does that on an annual basis as well. The uh, future of the, uh, uh, of the job landscape, um, you know, one of, one of the, uh, you know, things that we specifically have talked about is just, you know, cash compensation, total ca uh, cash compensation as well, variable pay. But one of the things that um, back in 2019, uh, one of my colleagues uh, conducted was uh, Dave Jackson was uh, specifically just an economic value of Salt Lake City's benefits. And back in uh, 2019, that value was $3,152. Um, we did the same analysis and in 2022, uh, this year, it's a little bit over uh, $3,400. And, you know, again, that conveys to me, uh, you know, from a competitive standpoint, from a benefit, um, you're basically leading um, your peers, not only in the public sector, but obviously in the private sector. And we probably, as I mentioned to you, about a dozen uh, surveys, I would uh, compensation surveys. I would say probably half of those are public sector, and Salt Lake City is is really who they're chasing um, year after year in regards of benefits as well as um, uh, wages. Um, and you can see just the number um, of different benefit levels, and this is not all encompassing, but you have a very rich benefit package that certainly. Um, you know, employees um, hopefully, uh, um, uh, you know, respect just how well thought and design, you know, HR and the council and the mayor, um, you know, conducts on an annual basis. You know, certainly in this market, cash is king, but, um, you know, total compensation, total rewards is certainly very important. Um, and depending on what time of, of, you know, tenure you are within your career, you know, if you're early on in your career and you're on your parents' health insurance, probably not, probably health insurance is not number one priority. It's probably saving as much money as you can for a down payment in this a very expensive housing market. But if you're, you know, in your 40s, 50s, or if you have a chronic condition, obviously medical insurance um, is, is, is huge. So, um, but I think you really cater to you know, the, the diversity of, of, of the generations that are in your workforce, which is great. Um, so the future, um, you know, landscape, you know, what do we see, you know, from our clients, from employers across the country uh, in this landscape is, is obviously we've all heard it is just burnout of employees and whether or not you're working hybrid, fully remote, or you're in the, or you're in the office, you know, it's it's been significant change over the past couple years, and and really training managers, making sure that there's empathy, making sure that um, uh, you know we you know collectively as a whole, um, you know, identify some of that burnout is is definitely key in regards of retention of employees. But you know, organizations have had really a, a difficult time dealing with the remote workforce and dealing with burnout specifically. And when now it's difficult to retain employees, you know, employers are, are certainly short staffed. Uh, second um, is 
you know, I think organizations that are going to be best positioned in the future, you know, to take advantage of, of talent is, you know, implement a gray uh, collar strategy. You know, we, it seems like we really pay attention quite a bit to the younger workforce, maybe mid-career, but we, what we don't pay attention to is that institutional knowledge of employees that are nearing retirement or maybe, you know, five, six, seven years close to retirement, that there's quite a bit of value that, um, that, that they offer. And sometimes we don't, you know, train uh, those employees, but I think it's imperative that you focus and, and concentrate on those employees because they're key in regards of succession planning, as well as, you know, how employers are trained, you know, throughout the city and, and throughout organizations. Uh, third, um, you know, again, the difficulty to managing, you know, that hybrid workforce, um, even a remote workforce, you know, company get togethers when you can get together organizations, department, you know, it's key to make sure that they're value added, that um, you're just not quote unquote pencil whipping that that get together. So I think it's important and, you know, there's statistics that have shown that, you know, if you really focus on those collective you know, team building events early on, especially early on in, in a candidate and now an employee's career, that it goes a long way and you, you retain those employees um, now as, as well as in, in the future. And then compensation is a shared mission and shared sense of ownership. Again, you know, I, I think this job market has really, in fact, made employers, private and public, relook at how they pay employees in regards to variable pay, whether that's a stay put bonus, whether that's more, more um, additional bonuses uh, specifically for performance or, or a job well done on a project. I think um, obviously we, if, you know, budget allows that it's, um, that might be a design in your compensation strategies. And as we move on, um, um, you know, freelancers, you know, uh, and I've heard this over the, the past number of years, you know, contractors, freelancers, you, they can work, you know, wherever, um, you know, for, for many positions, I realize uh, many positions here within the city, it's, that's very difficult, but um, that might be an option where you're hiring freelancers uh, at times for hard to fill positions. Work-life flexibility, I think the county has done a very good job in regards of, you know, remote, hybrid, and, and in the office. And I think em employees will, will definitely demand that. And if you don't offer it, you, I don't think you're going to be able to retain um, certain categories of employees. And, um, you know, lastly, um, and I think this is probably, um, you know, obvious, just your managers, um, training those managers to deal with sometimes a hybrid workforce, um, you know, mental illness, illnesses in the, in the workplace as well. I think, um, you know, that training is critical as well for employees that um, certainly need to, need to stay. And lastly, I talked about purpose. Um, I, I think, you know, public sector and the city has a great opportunity and sometimes, you know, public sector does, a very, does not do a very good job in regards of branding. I came from Salt Lake County. I led the HR um, for Salt Lake County, and we didn't do a very good job branding that sense of purpose. But as I mentioned prior, you know, employees want that sense of, uh, of, pur uh, of purpose. And, you know, but what's not a better purpose specifically, you know, where, you know, you're a sworn officer or working for the fire department or, or um, you know, dealing with housing or homelessness. I mean, that's purpose where, you know, you certainly have an advantage uh, specifically over private where, you know, sometimes it's just making money. Um, the public sector has a great opportunity where they can brand and, and really cater to some of the younger generation and, and appeal that there is purpose. And it's just not, you know, you're going to be paid market, you're going to be paid um, a competitive wage, but you have purpose in your job each and every day. And I think that's, that's huge when you're trying to brand. And, and that's probably, you know, uh, certainly in the data where you have that many of applicants for those positions. So job well done. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Council members, questions?
Do we have any data with the freelancer concept? I am one of those people who has been trying to cobble with literally three different revenue streams my life. Um, and I know coming to the city, one of the biggest sighs of relief has been health insurance that I'm not afraid to use, especially with kids. Um, but with the arrival of freelancers, kind of this transition of concepts, do you think the traditional benefits package needs to be reimagined maybe towards something closer to offering stipends for health care if we engage freelancers? Or do you think our traditional model is still working and applicable to the modern workforce? Uh, you know, I think thinking out, outside the box where, you know, there is a stipend where, you know, it, here, here's money, you know, towards um you know health insurance you know i i think it's a, i think that's very important um especially if you're young in your career and you know you may not have health insurance you know maybe if you have a working spouse yeah. you know th that freelancer model works but that's difficult and can i put a plug in for student loan repayment assistance <laughs> i'm gonna that's the only inheritance my kids get are my student loans <laughs> council member um, just a couple of quick points. We've actually been working with a couple, two or three of the departments in the city on the notion of the stipends. And we're also exploring a way to, a, a way, a way to figure out a program where we could help people with their student loans. So I stay tuned. Known. You guys are like walking in here has been the most amazing thing. I should have known you're already on it. Yeah, no, I love, I love being able to say it. So thank you. Yeah. So stay tuned. You'll hear, you'll hear more about that. That's D. Shane okay. County is is actually that they rolled student repayment specifically for um oh, just yeah for for attorney <laughs> for their for for their attorneys. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. I I appreciate the benefits that the city um has offered throughout the years. I was a staff planner before uh, many years ago, and the training that I was afforded um was very generous from Salt Lake City, and I was able to finish my master's degree. So uh, that's something that I really appreciate it uh, from the city. I think all of us are here for a purpose as well. So it's uh, it's uh, maybe we need to do a better job at explaining what the purpose is, but we are here because we feel like we can make a difference and we can certainly um, help the systems that we have and, and make improvements for the city of our uh, for the lives of our residents. But then all, um, lastly, you know, you were talking about a lot of the how organizations will be prepared to retain or to attract workers. And I think one of the things that we've had in mind um, with our West Side Land, Land Trust Initiative at the RDA is um, home ownership, affordable home ownership for um, those maybe startup uh, professionals mm -hmm. or, or smaller families. And one additionally to that we wanted to do something about a, a small percentage to separate out of those funds to have our first responders or our teachers uh, be able to enter that path so salt lake city employees enter that path of home ownership if they stay with us and at this in this market i think that would be a winner hopefully and hopefully my peers would support something like that as we look at the compensation plans thank you thank you Councilor, please. Oh, no, it was just to follow up on with Victoria's uh, comment on repayment. Isn't there a federal program where people that work in, in public sector can apply? Uh, it's, it's 10 years of on time pain, 10 years. 10 years of on time payments for public employees or nonprofit employees. In those 10 years, there's a lot of down payments on houses not being saved, a lot of medical things going on credit. If you have a child, you know, things like that, that those payments during that 10 years can still thwart pretty significantly. Oh, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thanks a lot. It's a very in depth and uh, I appreciate the report. We appreciate Ray. Thank you very much. Mike. Debbie. Thank you. David. Michael. Thank you. Ben, of course, always there for us. Appreciate that very much. Have a good night. Very much. Thank you. Okay, we're skipping number 10 because we already covered that. Oh, Ben's still at the table. He's just changing seats. This is budget amendment number six. Oh, that's a written briefing. So any questions about budget amendment six? We're gonna be talking about that uh, formal meeting. Okay, when we move on to board Appointments. Planning Commission, Rich Tuttle, whether he's here or he's on the screen. I am here. 
All right, Rich. Good evening, and uh, good evening. you have uh, five council members here. You have one on the screen, and you one have one uh, who's ex excused and at a trial. So, uh, thank you for applying and uh, looking forward to uh, letting us know about a little bit about yourself and why you want to be on the planning commission. Well. The second part of that is a complicated question. <laughs> the first part of it's not so hard. I've been a lifelong uh, resident mainly of Rose Park. I went to Rose Park Elementary School and to Northwest Junior High and West High School. And in my professional career, I went to work for Crossroads Urban Center. And then later on with Father Jerry Merrill, who as some of you may know, or it was responsible for housing development such as Escalante um, Place, the senior center here in Rose Park, senior housing in Rose Park, and got some experience around development issues and um, working with homeless people and people who are disadvantaged and eventually wound up working at the University of Utah. Uh, I addressed, uh, did some work with a regional organization that sent me to places like Northeastern Montana and Colorado and rural communities all over the West. Got a sense of things that were going on with um, rural communities in the West around housing issues and development issues. These were all uh, communities that were being impacted by energy development and all mostly along the uh, overthrust belt in uh, Wyoming and Montana. And I felt like we were successful in a lot of the things that we did to try and make lives better for people living in poverty and people who were disenfranchised. And with housing and having places to live and, and functional cities being all a part of that. And I thought at this stage in my life, it was time for me to get involved with people who are having an impact on making decisions that will make lives better for people in our city and the planning commission seemed like a good place to do that. Thank you very much. Council members, any questions for Mr. Tuttle? Mr. Tuttle, I know you by reputation. I'm so excited to see your face. Thank you for stepping up on behalf of District 1 and being part of what makes us the best side, not just the west side. Thank you very much. And I will say that one of the, I don't think I would have applied for this two years ago or even a year ago, but I think that this council, among all the people who I talk to regularly, has a real chance to change some things and improve things that may already be in process. And so, your reputation is growing among the people that I work with and know. And I'm glad to be invited to be some part of that in a way. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Tuttle. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your engagement in the city and uh, moving us forward. So, uh, your name will be put on the consent agenda for this evening's formal meeting. Uh, as other council chairs have said, you need not be present to win, uh, but you're always more than welcome to uh, join the, the formal council uh, meeting. But I appreciate your in engagement and I appreciate your, uh, uh, your future work on the uh, planning commission. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the Next board appointment, uh, the city and county building conservation and use committee, Catherine Tucker. Hi. 
Can you Hi, Catherine. How are you? Oh, just fine. Welcome to uh, this evening's meeting. We have uh, five council members here. We have one on this on the on the uh, WebEx with you, and um, I'm I'm so happy to see you here tonight. And would tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to be on this uh, commission. Sure. Um, so I uh, work currently as a senior engineer at Reedley Engineers. Um, I'm also a licensed architect and a member of the American Institute of Architects. Um, I have two master's degrees, one from the University of Utah in architecture and a second one in civil structural engineering. I've lived in Salt Lake all of my life, except for the portions when I left for college. Um, I went to Lowell Elementary School in the Avs and was, I think, the first class in the IB program at West High School. Um, the city county building is a landmark building architecturally. It's an important piece of what I would consider our urban fabric and a jewelry piece as far as I'm concerned. Additionally, from a structural standpoint, um, it's very seismically significant. It's the first seismic base isolated building in the United States that's um, a historic register building. Um, my two passions that I'm trying to focus on very narrowly. The first, I do a lot of outreach activities in the Salt Lake Valley, trying to encourage underrepresented youth to pursue fields in STEM, but more specifically in architecture and engineering. Um, I do some outreach activities with underrepresented um, junior high age girls and minorities. My second area of focus is what's considered to be unreinforced masonry. And um, similar to say the Fix the Bricks program that I've been involved with and the editing of the unreinforced masonry seismic design guide, um, the Salt Lake City and County building is another example of this type of architecture. It's, I think, a prime point for Salt Lake City to be able to say, Yes, unreinforced masonry is beautiful, it's historic, and we need to be careful with it living on the Wasatch Front, um, considering our high probability of having a major seismic event. So it seems to me that this is filling, um, it's, it's a perfect place for me to be. Um, Salt Lake City is you know, near and dear to my heart. It's where I've grown up, it's where I've raised my kids, and we're down in that region of Salt Lake very frequently. Um, so it, being a good steward of the building comes naturally. In addition to that, it fits well with my academic um, interests. And so it just seems like a really good fit. Thank you, Catherine. Any questions from council members? I I wanted to say that I I learned something new uh, because of your presentation. So thank you. I didn't know this was the first building that had uh, the isolation thing, uh, whatever isolate, whatever the word is. Yes, it moves. Um, so I appreciate that, and I love this building. I'm, I love all architecture, and this is uh, one of for sure jewels of the city. So I'm very excited for you to join this commission, Mr. Chair. <laughs> And just a point of clarification, as far as I know, it's not the first, right? But it is the first historic in the United States. It is cited that way in a few different textbooks. And so I think it's, you know, certainly historic buildings have their own challenges. And I think that we have several jewels of our city. Um, and being able to use the Salt Lake City and County building as a prime example and then lead by example so that we can seismically retrofit and make safe the rest of our unreinforced masonry structures. That's my primary goal professionally. Thank you. And Councilman Romano? Yeah, Catherine, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being willing to volunteer your time to our city and especially this important building. I uh, frankly was blown away by your presentation. You're eminently qualified and um, I am so impressed with your history in the city, but also your um, knowledge of architecture and engineering and to have someone of your caliber helping um, on our city and county building committee is uh, such an honor. So thank you so much. 
The honor's all mine. I'm really thankful for being nominated. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Catherine. I appreciate that. And, and I uh, appreciate you volunteering in your engagement in the city and in, uh, in this in this endeavor. So appreciate that very much. You'll be on our consent agenda for this evening's formal meeting. You need not be present to win, uh, but you can always join us at the seven o'clock and uh, and uh, see how the city works some more. So appreciate that very much, and you have a great evening. Thanks. Thank you. Council, we'll move on to number the bicycle advisory committee and Sarah Johnson. Ah, there she is. I was wondering who those in the corner. I knew you were going to come up. Hi, Sarah. Good evening, council members. Thank you for your time this evening. I'm excited to be considered for the bicycle advisory committee. And also, I want to say thank you to council member Darren Mono. I don't know if you remember, you knocked on my door during the last campaign and I asked how can I be more involved in bicycle infrastructure for the city? And he's the one who introduced me to the opportunity to be on this committee. I have a deep desire to be on this committee, both personally and professionally. On a personal level, I am an avid bike commuter. Throughout my adult life, I've lived a uh, combined six years without a car, and that's been in various cities. And that also includes Minneapolis year round. I have bike commuted in as cold as 20 below. It has not stopped me. <laughs> uh, and tonight, I bike commuted here to this meeting. Uh, professionally, I've worked in the bike industry for a total of 10 years. I started at Quality Bicycle Products as a supply chain analyst. I worked at Specialized Bicycle Components as the leader of global planning. And currently, I'm the chief operating officer for Bunch Bikes. It's the leading front-loading cargo e-bike brand. Um, so this is a style of biking that is prevalent in Scandinavia. Um, you'll see families biking. They have their kids sitting in the front on the little benches. That's what our bikes are. I think it can be really revolutionary here in North America. It's an untapped market. It could really help, uh, especially in Salt Lake City with our air quality issues. I would love to see them take hold here in the city. Um, throughout my career also, I have been an advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is an area that is very important within the bike industry that has generally been pretty homogenous. Um, last year, I was asked to be on a panel for the Utah Bike Summit. I was on a career youth panel, and that was focused towards underrepresented youth and share with them the opportunities of working within the bike industry. Um, most importantly, though, community is deeply important to me, and I feel like this is a meaningful way that I can contribute to my community here in Salt Lake City. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Sarah. I uh, appreciate that very much. Wow, 20 below. That's, uh, that's, that's cold. You, you do still sweat sometimes, and then you get really cold when you stop moving. So then quickly. you have to keep moving. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, nothing about Mr. gear ratios or, you know, brakes. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say thank you so much for applying to the board. I'm so excited to see you. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person to, uh, to speak to you face to face again. But I'm so glad that you are now here um, and you're going to be on the bicycle advisory board. So thank you so much for willing being willing to volunteer your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And I appreciate that. And I, again, I, I love your enthusiasm. And your engagement with the city. So, uh, like I said, the other two uh, uh, board appointees, you'll be on our formal consent agenda this evening, and you need not be present to win. Uh, you can okay. ride your bike home. I will. I will bike sunset. home then. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. And next, we have the transportation advisory board, Tyler Schmidt. There he is. Hey, Tyler, how are you? Can you hear me just fine? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Tyler Schmidt. Uh, currently, uh, I live in Davis County. I have lived in Salt Lake County. I am the uh, traffic engineer for UDOT that is over Salt Lake City. Uh, my counterpart, or my person I replaced, Marge Rasmussen, was 
uh, a part of this committee as well. She suggested that I become a member uh, to have knowledge of the inner workings, you know, of what Salt Lake City's doing and also combine, you know, what we're doing with UDOT and try and make a, a smooth, you know, transition between our projects and uh, see where we can partner and uh, overlap. Uh, I've been, I graduated from the University of Utah with a civil engineering degree in 2015. And uh, I've been working with uh, traffic and safety for UDOT for the last four years. Thank you very much, Tyler. Questions for Tyler? Tyler, you're off the hook on questions. Appreciate okay. that. Appreciate your engagement. I appreciate you working with the uh, transportation board. This is uh, wonderful. Uh, and, and also making our roads and safety, uh, safer. So tonight you'll be on our consent agenda. You yeah. need to be present to win, uh, but you're always welcome to join our uh, council meetings and our formal sessions. But I appreciate your engagement and I look forward to your work on the, uh, board. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Council that concludes. The work session. Do we need to? We're going to go to closed session. Yes, you can do that uh, for something quick that you can do over dinner. Yes. So you oh. can do a motion now. Okay. And the purpose is for um, deployment of security and and also legal advice. Uh -huh. So deployment of security devices and legal advice. Mr. Chair, I move that we go into a closed session for the purpose of discussing um, legal advice and deployment of security devices. Second. So, the motion from Councilmember Ward and a second from Councilmember Pui. Any discussion on this matter? No discussion. I will roll call it. Councilmember Pui? Yes. Councilmember Wharton? Yes. Councilmember Vellamores? Yes. Councilmember Pichero? Yes. Councilmember Mano? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes. Uh, six to zero with Councilmember Fowler absent. So we will move into closed session as we eat. And Council Chair, could you clarify that you'll be meeting at the formal meeting next, correct? At the end of the closed oh, session. Oh, and after the, thank you very much. After the uh, closed session, we'll be meeting in, into the, going into the formal session at this. We will not be coming back to the work session. Should I stay in this link? Okay, thank you. Yes, Darren, yes. we'll be in the same link. Thank you. We just need a few moments. <laughs>